the Air Resources Board. Have done so for about 27 years. Been in enforcement most of my career. Gone all over the state, <clears throat> all over the uh, country. Enforcing. Enforcing a, a, a series of regulations from California and other states. My bent is enforcement. Um, because I don't like people getting mad at me, and I'm not afraid to speak in public, and I know the rules, they put me in this position. This morning we're going to be talking about the off-road regulation. Uh, this rule has been around for a while, uh, and we'll go through several different parts of it, actually all of it. I have a co-worker here named Tian Tran. Tian actually works in the group that oversees the implementation of this regulation. Uh, normally I can go through this material and if questions are no problem, but if we have something crazy or more complicated than the basis of this class, I will be asking Tian to come up and give us some, some help on that. If you have particular questions about your fleet that I can't answer, I am always going to direct you to, to uh, call the hotline for the off-road regulation group and TN is part of that group. You'll get that information as we go through. Um, some, of the information, <coughs> some of the information I will not cover, only because it's uh, pretty common. Um, the need for the regulation is more or less what the, what the problems are and why we're doing these regulations. I'll go through that fairly quickly, try and get to the regulatory background, the applicability, and then we'll deal with regulation and requirements as we go through. Um, first things first, why are we doing this? Uh, I think most people have been around long enough in, in, in California especially to understand that we do have and have had a problem for a long time with our air. Uh, we found out over the course of many years, in fact, ARB has been around for more than 50 years and in that period of time we've learned a couple of things, I think. Um, we've learned that diesel engines are going to be the thing uh, for the future, for now and for the future that we have to focus on because the pollutants coming from them have more impact than almost any of the other pollutants that we worry about. Um, oxides, of, oxides of nitrogen and particulate matter are the two main uh, chemicals that we're worried about. Let me go through this. Um, the big thing about particulate matter with um, relation to diesel engines, dust is dust for most people. But when you're talking about the dust that comes from a diesel engine, we're not talking about just plain dirt. We're talking about particulates that are so small that they bypass your body's mechanisms for controlling them, which that's really small. Uh, we're talking about things that are in the PM10 or below range. PM10 is 10 microns and below. Anything that's that small can go right down into your lungs and bypass any of the mucous membranes, hairs, or anything that your body normally would use to get rid of that stuff. On top of that, the, stu the substance has been proven by multiple studies to have multiple toxic effects. Um, if you want a relation, um, um, a relation as to how big this stuff is or how small this stuff is, I always try and compare it to human hair. Because human hair, if you cut a piece of human hair in half and try and measure the diameter, it's roughly 60 to 70 microns. So we're 1 6 to 1 7 the diameter of a human hair is what's coming out of a diesel engine. In fact, it's even smaller than that because more than 95% of the particulate matter coming from a diesel engine is PM 2.5 and below. So it's incredibly small stuff, gets very deep in our lungs, and causes many different chemical hazardous issues. <clears throat> the regulation itself. I told you a minute ago that our, our agency has been around for more than 50 years. Now, in that time, we have focused on what we call criteria pollutants. And there's five or six different pollutants that have been known to cause major issues. And you've heard of these things. I've already said NOx is one. Particulate matter in general was one of the others. Uh, oxi I mean, um, the ozone, um, lead, carbon dioxide. These are all things that for the most of our history, we considered to be equivalent as far as how they impacted our population. And about 20 years ago, the study started to prove that it wasn't that particulate matter, and in particular diesel particulate matter, has more than seven to ten times more impact than all the rest of those pollutants combined. Because of that, our agency and the federal government together, especially our agency, 
started to regulate diesel particulate matter more effectively and more consistently. In 1998, it was designated as a toxic airborne contaminant. And that may not mean anything to anybody here that doesn't work in air pollution. However, what you should know is that designation forces my agency to regulate this substance at a more high level than they would have normally. And from 1998, every single diesel regulation, including the off-road rule, was started at that point. In 2000, we came up with the plan. So it was designated 98. And we came up with a plan. The plan was nothing more than a document that we used to set goals and to say how we're going to reach those goals. Now the goals were reduction of particulate matter in the state of California in our ambient levels of air. Uh, the first goal was a 75% reduction by 2010. The second goal was an 85% reduction uh, by 2020. And that's from 1990 levels as a comparison. Does anybody think if we got to the 2010 level? Did we reduce particulate matter by 75% by 2010 in California? Diesel particulate matter? Everybody's looking at me like a... Anybody want to... Most people are going to say no. But actually, we not only did meet that level, but we exceeded that level. It had really little to do with us, though. Anyone know what happened between 96 and 2010 that could have impacted us? Recession. Recession, yeah. We had tens of thousands of pieces of equipment, both off-road, on-road, that were no longer being used, or at least put off to the side, and it had a tremendously good impact on our air. Now we're starting to ramp back up, and the regulations are having more of an impact. We don't know if we're going to go to the 2020 level. We're optimistic, but that's why you're here. That's why I'm here to explain this, to help you understand what it is. The plan actually has multi multiple parts on how we're going to achieve this. Number one, we have uh, stricter new engine standards. And just so you know right off the bat, this is confusing for a lot of people. The Air Resources Board does not set standards for new engines. That is set by federal EPA. So if you're going to have an engine for sale anywhere in the United States, it has to go through a certification program through federal EPA. Now, ARB has a sister program that was in place actually before EPA for certifying engines but their stuff takes precedence. Um, we, work, we work with them to try and make sure that what they're certifying will help us meet our standards. And that's why uh, the 2007 engines uh, for on-road and the tier four final engines uh, and the 2010 engines for on-road all came about is because of the cooperation between ARB and the rest of the states, but ARB had a lot to do with it and the federal government. That's for new engines. For existing engines, um, this is something that's happening in California that's not happening anywhere else. And that is that what we're saying here is because of the problem that we have, if you want to run older technology, we're going to require you to clean it up. That's not happening anywhere else in the United States, okay? or very few places. That the new technology requires a lot of uh, catalytic systems. And uh, anybody that's been in the industry for a long time knows that diesel fuel historically has had a really high sulfur content. In fact, um, traditional diesel fuel 20 years ago would have somewhere between 500 and 5,000 ppm, or parts per million. With a catalytic system, you cannot have any more than about 15 parts per million, otherwise you poison the catalysts. So California implemented a uh, low sulfur diesel fuel just for California. And that was adopted by the federal government just a couple of years later. So that is a nationwide um, requirement now. You, you, not, you cannot legally produce or purchase high sulfur diesel, anything higher than 15 ppm anywhere in the, in the United States. One other thing I'd like to say about that, though, is there are a lot of tanks in the United States that may have some older fuel in them. And also, we're close enough to a border here that people have a tendency to sometimes go across the border to purchase fuel because it might be less expensive. With the new engines and the catalytic systems, it would take just one tank of, that, of any type of fuel that has a higher sulfur content to poison the catalyst and ruin those systems. Uh, does anybody here know how much those systems cost to replace? A catalytic converter well, not a catalytic converter per se, but on a diesel engine it would be a particulate trap that has a catalyst system as part of it. 
think it's between five and ten. You're you're right on. Most of those, uh, just the core, of one of these filters can cost five to ten thousand dollars. The whole system itself to install can be up to twenty thousand dollars. But the core replacement, and that's what you'd have to do if you poisoned it with a high sulfur fuel. The core would be no good. You'd have to replace it. Otherwise, the system would clog up constantly. Um, so it's not something you want to take, uh, you want to do. So uh, the reason I bring that up is because of the, the position where you are here in relation to a border of a country that doesn't have the same fuel standards that we have. So, I mean, you might be able to buy low sulfur diesel in Mexico, but chances are you don't know what you're getting when you buy it there. You could buy something that has 10,000 ppm or something that has 15. You don't know. They don't have the same standards. And older tanks that have older fuel in them will also have that issue as well. It's, it's something to be uh, aware of. Okay, so you're saying even if you were to drive your personal truck into Mexico, you need fuel not fuel there? The diesel fuel. Yeah, a diesel truck. Okay, so any, any um, diesel truck built to a model year, on-road diesel truck built to a 2007 model year engine standard, so that would be your 08 trucks and newer, has a catalytic filter system in it. And if you were to drive that across the border and buy fuel from Mexico, you're taking a risk that you're going to poison the catalyst. Fred, also, this could be high sulfur diesel, maybe it's available on Indian reservations? Uh, you know, if they're in the United States, they're not allowed to sell anything higher than the 15 ppm diesel. That is a nationwide, and that's, I know that the um, Indian lands are considered tribal and they're their own countries within our countries, but they still have to abide by the environmental regulations that, uh, that our nation sets. <clears throat> it's just a, an enforcement issue that we have with them. So the filter, this is going to be something. Um, the filter uh, uh, systems, they come in of, of different types. The older ones are almost exactly like the catalytic converters that you have on your regular gasoline automobile. Pass-through systems, they just have a catalyst on them as the particulate matter goes through there. Diesel particulate matter is carbonation, so the catalyst will act to reduce that substance but it only reduces it to a maximum of about 50%. For our purposes in the state, we need it to be more than that. So level two filters are still not good enough, but they require the exhaust to go through a little bit different uh, path that takes out more of this filter than the level one filters. It still is only capable of getting up to about 85%. It's not until you get to the level three filters, which is what's required now on all new technology, the 2007 engines on on-road and the tier four final engines on off-road, portable, and stationary, all have to have this level three particulate trap, which is capable of reducing a minimum of 85% of the particulate matter coming from that engine. I say a minimum because most of these traps can actually control up to 99.9% .9 of all the particulate matter coming through these, the, coming out of these engines. <clears throat> they are a problem for the people that own and operate them because they change the way you run the engines. They change the way, they actually add a, a maintenance parameter that you did not have before. You have to take care of the filter, you have to take care of the engine prior to something happening to the, to the filter. So here's the deal. Anything that goes through these engines, anything, is going to wind up in the filter. If it's going through the combustion process of the engine, it's going to go through the filter. So if you don't maintain the engine and it burns more oil, or you have a lot of uh, dust from a dusty environment going through it, all that stuff is going to wind up in the filter, and it has an opportunity to destroy the element in the filter that makes it function properly. So there's maintenance on top of maintenance. And for the engine itself, it has to be pre-maintenance, not wait till something breaks. Now, one of the biggest examples I can use of that is a turbocharger. Anybody familiar with how often turbochargers fail on diesel engines? On a new diesel engine, you, if you get, it, it should go past 100,000 miles or, or so many thousand hours before anything goes wrong, if you don't take care of it, okay? Uh, but if a turbo fails, what normally happens is you have a tremendous amount of raw liquid hydrocarbon being thrown through the exhaust all at once. That deposits on the filter element, and you've just wasted the filter element. They're very difficult to recover if that happens. So the option is to try and not let that happen. Um, this is just a piece of advice. There's no regulation that requires this. But if you're part of a maintenance program for any diesel engine that has a filter on it, you should be doing oil testing on a quarterly basis at that minimum. 
because the oil testing will give you information on what parts of the engine are having problems or getting ready to fail, sometimes as much as six months in advance of when something's going to fail. And they're not that expensive. You can go to almost any dealership that deals with diesel engines and they'll charge anywhere from $20 to $40 to do an oil test. Okay. <clears throat> Enough about filters. Let's talk about the regulation. So this rule, uh, this rule was actually adopted in 2007. It was not implemented until 2010, and that's not normal. Why do you think there was a three-year lag between when we adopted it and when we actually implemented it? Recession. No. Okay. Nothing to do with recession. Did you get approval from the EPA? That's exactly correct. So one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, unless you're in the industry, is that because we were in existence, our agency was in existence prior to 1970, and federal EPA was created in 1970, anything we were doing before 1970, the federal government said, keep doing, you're good. Even though they had the authority to tell us we couldn't do it, because they took, once federal EPA was created, they took precedence over everything in the United States related to the environment. But before they were created, we were working on um, vehicles, motor, motor vehicles. They allowed us to continue that so we can regulate those. But any time we create a new program that deals with technology or something that we were not regulating prior to 1970, we have to ask permission from the federal government before we can actually implement those rules. Now, they had a problem with us and the way our rule was written. And it has, it's primarily because we were sued by somebody based on OSHA regulations. Is anybody familiar with this? So on an off-road piece of equipment, we were originally required, the rule uh, before 2010, originally required uh, retrofit filters. It was a requirement. You had to put retrofits on your off-road vehicles. The problem with that is putting a retrofit filter on any off-road vehicle, there's no space inside the engine compartment because they're already encapsulated pretty closely. So it oftentimes had to go on top somewhere. Anything that blocks the view of the operator at all, even if it's a centimeter, is considered illegal by OSHA because of safety regulations. So they won the suit. We had to take that requirement out of our regulation. But because of that suit and because of a couple of other things that were going on with this regulation, federal EPA withheld their approval to let us implement the regulation. So there's a three-year lag between when we wanted to do it and when they let us do it. That's why 2010 is when it actually came about. The rule itself used to be a particulate matter and diesel reduction plan. The, the biggest change aside from not requiring filtration systems that happened with the 2010 implementation was that it became a NOx reduction rule, not a PM reduction rule. Now you may think that's ridiculous after I was talking about PM being a big problem, but we know from our studies and from the mechanics and the engineering and, and everything we see, that if we reduce the NOx, we are also reducing the particulate matter. The engines get cleaner in both. So a NOx reduction regulation is fine with us. That, that achieves what we want to achieve either way. Okay? <clears throat> this rule affects anything off-road in California, and I'll talk about that more in just a few minutes, but ex all existing and all new off-road vehicles. Um, construction, mining, they're used for a number of different purposes. Let's talk about who's what, who, what is affected. If you, own, if you own a business that runs this kind of equipment, you're going to be affected. Individuals that own equipment, depending on how much you have and how you use it, you could be affected. Um, government agencies, any government agency that owns this type of equipment, obviously is going to have to comply with this regulation. A lot of our regulations actually, if you're talking about on-road, we actually separate out different entities like government agencies. We regulate them separately and differently. And people always tell me, well, why, aren't you, why are you regulating the public without regulating the government? We're not. We regulate the government first in most cases. We make the government agencies do it, and then we regulate the public. In this case, that was not done. For off-road vehicles, everybody was regulated at exactly the same time. There is no differentiation between private and public as far as this rule is concerned. Okay? What we're talking about here, <clears throat> as far as um, what's under the rule, single, single engine vehicles operating in California running any form of diesel. Does anybody know how many different kinds of diesel fuel there are? 
there's at least 20. At least 20. And I, I get people who tell me or say to me all the time, they think they don't have to follow this rule because they use biodiesel. The name is, I mean, diesel's in the damn name. Biodiesel. The, any formulation of diesel at all that runs on a compression ignition engine falls under the category that this rule requires you to, to do something. Because it doesn't matter what form of diesel it is, if it's done, if it's used in a compression ignition engine, the emission profile is going to be similar. We're still looking for the same emission reductions from those types of, of engines. Red dye diesel is, um, are you familiar with what red dye diesel is first? Some say yes, okay. Red dye diesel is, is the exact same formulation as standard uh, diesel. The only difference is the dye marker is added because the off-road and construction use is taxed less by the federal government. So the federal government requires anybody using it for off-highway to dye it so that uh, if it's an on-highway on use, it's actually illegal to use on-highway. So it's just a dye marker. It doesn't change any of the emission profile whatsoever. We're talking about engines or vehicles that move themselves. What is a vehicle that doesn't move itself and runs a uh, diesel engine or gas? Anybody know? Well, no, I'm not talking stationary. It doesn't stay put. It moves, but it doesn't move itself. Like a trencher? Trencher, well, trencher actually moves itself. Portable, portable equipment is the word, the phrase I'm using, okay? Portable generators, compressors, anything that runs an engine, it does work, but it has to be towed. That's portable and that's a completely different animal. In fact, a lot of people consider it to be a completely different monster, but it, it is a completely different animal. Uh, so no, gener no generators. <clears throat> For this rule, it has to be at least 25 horsepower to fall under the regulation. 25 horsepower or greater. So let's go down the list again. It's in California, it's running diesel, 25 horsepower or greater, self-propelled, true off-road is the last one, okay? What does that mean? Does anybody know how the federal government certifies engines? Maybe, maybe not, okay, well they certify four classes of engines. They certify off-road, they certify on-road, they certify stationary, and they certify portable. I told you earlier that they certify all new engines, so it has to be one of those four categories. If you're talking about off-road, portable, and stationary, they certify it to something called a tier standard. In the back of your handout, you have a tier chart. So I think it's the last page in there. Um, and you, if you can take a look at that right now to, to, to see what I'm talking about. So like the very last page of the, the whole handout, except for the, no, it's the second to last. It's all rainbow chart is what it looks like. Everybody see that? Tiers are, are based or determined on a comparison between the horsepower and the model year of the engine. And you can look at that chart. On one side it will say horsepower, on the other side it will say model year. You go down to where the two meet and you'll know what the tier certification standard was for that particular type of engine on that particular year. Okay? They range, the, the horsepower ranges are usually 50 to 100 horsepower, so you have 25 to 75 horsepower, something of that nature. And uh, then you, you can see where the tiers change. Now when there's a tier change, what that means is the emission level that the federal government sets has gone down. You're changing tiers, which means you're improving the emission profile, as far as we're concerned, of that engine. So a higher tier means lower emissions. There are literally, there are actually five different tiers. You got tier zero, and maybe six, let me think about this. Tier zero, tier one, two, three, four interim, and tier four final. And you can see that by the color chart, okay? Yes, sir. They're coming out with tier five. The, I don't know that they're gonna call it tier five. They're looking at a um, ultra low diesel engine, and they're, they're trying to figure out exactly what they're gonna do as far as calling it tier. I, the best of my knowledge right now, they're not going to call it Tier 5. It's, it's go, because it's not going to be something that's absolutely required, at least not yet. So I'm not 100% sure, but I have heard some inklings that there is a cleaner engine than the Tier 4 final, which impresses me tremendously because diesel technology, when you get to Tier 4 final or the 2010 on-road engine, you're practically zero emissions as it is for diesel technology. 
So it's going to be a, a very difficult, in my opinion, almost impossible to get any lower, but they are working on it. Okay. And just so, uh, one of the other questions I usually get from people is, where are we going? Where are we going with technology? The you know, diesel engine, I've just said, once you get to Tier 4 final or 2010 on-road, you're pretty much at what I consider, or most people consider, to be the end of the road for diesel technology. Where are we going from that? Well, I can tell you. Yes. Zero to near zero emissions. Yeah, so she's actually got it 100% right. In this state, we're, we're talking about zero to zero, near zero, which the only way that we know of right now to achieve that, unless they come up with a Tier 5, is electric, hybrid, uh, and some other form of combustion process that is near zero. And if you think that's impossible, <clears throat> I can't advertise for a company, but I will tell you that Cummins has almost has certified one engine, and they're working on another one to work on natural gas. They're natural gas, they, they, uh, they've got a seven liter engine, and they're working on a 12 liter engine that are practically zero emissions. There's no particulate matter, and your NOx rate, instead of being 0.01, is point. 001 or something of that nature. It's ridiculous how low the emission rate is on these. If you want public funding for anything, I'm going to tell you right now, your best avenue, regardless of what you want to use the engine for, is going to go hybrid, electric, or something of that nature. That's where a lot of the public funding is going to right now. All right, so we get the idea about what falls under this rule? Okay, good. <clears throat> I'll ask you that again. We'll come back to that again later. So, one of the other things that I have often come up is, what do I mean by true off-road? That was one of the five things that I used to designate what falls under this route. What do I mean by true off-road? I told you that the federal government certifies four different types of engines. But it's confusing to people if they have a vehicle or uh, an engine that they use off-road, and it never goes on-road, and they consider it to be an off-road vehicle or an off-road engine. And that may not be true. The perfect example is shown on the screen. That is a water truck. Uh, there are multiple, multiple uh, construction companies that have tons and tons of water trucks because they have to to control dust. They don't register them for on-road use. They tow them from one site to another, and then they allow them to run on that site as an off-road vehicle. They consider them to be off-road because those vehicles never drive on-road. For us, I don't care how you use the vehicle. I care about the certification standard that the federal government put that vehicle under. And the only way I can determine that is by looking at something called the emission control label. A water truck, and the reason I bring this up, is almost always going to be built to an on-road standard. It'll have backup lights, it'll have headlights, it has the safety features that most on-road vehicles have. It's registrable for on-road use. The fact that you don't register for that means nothing as far as we're concerned because it's built as an on-road vehicle, so we're going to regulate it as an on-road vehicle. The, uh, the water trucks almost always fall under the truck and bus regulation, which is an on-road regulation. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, good. If you're not sure whether or not it's off-road or on-road, I'm going to have you go to the engine and try and find the emission control label. Now, you may or may not be able to find it. It depends on a lot of things. How old is the engine? If it's older than 1988, you may not have one on an off-road vehicle because that's when they first started to require them on off-road off vehicles. If it's an on-road vehicle, that goes all the way back to 1974 where they were required to have those. But even, even if there's a requirement, that doesn't mean you're going to be able to find it. Because these labels come off. They get painted over. They disappear. Okay? That's actually been one of the biggest issues that we've had trying to help people because we require them, if they're going to report to us, to give us information that's on that label. And they've got to get it from their engine because that's the only place it exists. If you don't find and if you're looking for a label on an engine and you want to know which one's the right one, the emission control label, they always start with the same phrase at the top of the label. It says, important engine information. You can see it at the top of this one. That when you see that phrase on a label, almost without exception, that is going to be your emission control label. Now, there are a couple of places you can look at these to determine whether it's an on-road or off-road vehicle. The first place would be the family name. Well, this is the family name right here. Now, you can see the family name um, is 12 digits. 12 characters, uh, and if it has a decimal point, it includes the decimal point. 
the first character is always the model year of the engine. All right, always the model year. Now that one says Y, so we have to, uh, that doesn't tell me anything, because Y doesn't say anything. Sometimes you'll have a number, so it'll be an 8 or something like that, and you know that's 2008. But Y, there's a chart you can read that actually details what the Y means, what, what model year that is. On the label itself, <coughs> it should also tell you. You can see that this one actually conforms to model year 2000. And it says non-road compression engine. So this, there's a lot of confusing things about this, but when you use the term off-road, off-road is one term, non-road is another, off-highway is another. They all mean the same thing. In this state, we use uh, off-road. The federal government uses non-road or off-highway, okay? But they all mean the same thing. If you don't see that terminology on there, another thing you can look for somewhere on the label and usually it's, you'll have the, the year right here, you'll have the next three characters usually represent the uh, company that manufactured this engine. And then there will be a single letter, either L or H. Now there's two other ones it could be, but L or H are what we're interested in right now. L designates off highway. H designates on highway. Okay. In fact, <clears throat> let me uh, bring up this next one. Can you tell me what that is? Looking at that label, is that on highway or off highway? Based on what I told you just a minute ago. Look for the things I just talked about. It says there's an H there, right? In the family name, there's an H. This is an on highway engine. Okay? Even though it doesn't say on highway anywhere else on that label, you can read it all you want. I tried yesterday. It doesn't say on highway. But there's an H, so it's on highway. This conforms to a model year 2008. The first letter of the family name is 8 for 2008. CPX is Caterpillar. There are several places online where you can take this family name and pop it in there and they will tell you what everything means. Okay? Literally dozens of them. I've, I've used them multiple times. And I don't find one better than the other. They all do pretty much the same thing. Okay? Anybody have any questions on this? Okay. Let's talk about what else is affected. There are some on-road vehicles that are into this regulation. So part of the problem with writing a regulation, any regulation, when you're trying to encapsulate a group of vehicles or a particular type of vehicles, is there are always exceptions. So, and you always have to bring in, because of the rulemaking process, you have to bring in all the <laughs> affected parties. That you can't just say, thou shalt. We have to bring in anybody that wants to say anything into the process, and they have to have the ability to tell us that what we're doing is right or wrong, or they want changes, okay? So one of the things that happened with the production of the on-road and off-road regulations is the, the companies that own and run oil fields came to us and they basically said, listen, we've got a number of vehicles that you're telling us are on road and they will never, ever, 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 ever go on road. They stay on the oil fields. That's all they do. They're there all the time. Their entire life is on the oil fields. And, and so we capitulated and said, all right. Now, the reason they wanted to do that is because of the requirements. For on road trucks, are we requiring filters right now? Absolutely. For off-road vehicles, is there a lot of turnover right now? Not as much, because the off-road regulation was several years further along as far as when the compliance dates were than the on-road regulation. So it was to their benefit to have them on the, in the off-road regulation. But that's okay. For us, it, it, um, we were able to get the emission benefits either way, so we went ahead and capitulated on that. So natural gas and oil field are part of this, all types. Two engine cranes and water well drilling rigs also had the same issues. They're part of this regulation. Um, even tier zeros. And there are some other two engine vehicles that do fall under this, even though they're on-road vehicles. If you have an odd case, uh, I'm going to ask the, the question I asked yesterday. What is the problem with a, a secondary engine on a vehicle? If you have a two engine vehicle, we got one that drives it, one is doing something else. What's the problem for us with a vehicle having two engines? Well, one which regulation? To put yeah, which regulation to put it under? Because all these rules, the off-road, on-road, 
um, PAU, they all deal with the main drive engine. So we've got this other engine that's being towed around. It's portable. It can go all over the state. It can produce pollution all over the state, but it doesn't drive the vehicle. So how do we how to categorize that? It's a portable engine. Remember, it has to be towed somewhere. And because portable engines are handled under a completely separate program, it makes it incredibly difficult for us when we're trying to regulate the main engine of a vehicle that has two engines. So what we did is whenever we have two engine vehicles, we grab both engines and bring them into this rule for the most part. That still doesn't solve the problem though. And I don't know how San Diego, maybe Tim, you can help me with this. I don't know how San Diego deals with this, but the local districts, for those of you that don't know this, there are 35 local districts in the state. And we're in San Diego's purview right now, San Diego County Air Pollution Control District because they are the people that live here and work here and manage the air pollution in this area. They have primary enforcement authority in San Diego for most things, um, not most on road unless we have an agreement, which we do, but that's another story altogether. Um, for portable, even though that's a mobile source, the enforcement authority for portable has always rested with the local district. So here you got a vehicle that we've pulled both engines into one of our rules and the locals have control over the portable, so there's a dichotomy of control there. And in some districts, and this is why I was asking, maybe you can help me out, in some districts in the state of California, even though we say both engines in our, are in our rule, the local district still requires the owner of that vehicle to get a permit for running that secondary engine around. You know how San Diego deals with it? Yeah, that's the case here too. So you could have, you have a two-engine vehicle, you could have one that's, that's uh, registered in the- The PERP program. PERP program. And then the on-road, you know, the drive engine is going to be uh, something to it. Or the off-road, I mean, because these are in the off-road engines, so. Yeah. yeah so uh, both may be in off indoors, and then, but we're still going to require that that auxiliary engine have a separate. Yeah, so if you have vehicles like that, I feel sorry for you, actually, because it's not easy to deal with it. We're telling you that you have to have both of them comply with the standards of this regulation, but you still have to have a permit to operate from the local district where that vehicle is run. And that can be very daunting, but it is, it's, it's something that's not going to change. And it depends on where you run the vehicle. Um, there are many districts that don't do that, like Sacramento County. They don't, they don't care. It, it's, if it's indoors, they don't want to deal with it, right? If it's, if it's a two engine vehicle. Anyway, you get the idea. <clears throat> two engine vehicles subject to the off-road. Um, they have to have a uh, secondary engine greater than or equal to 50 horsepower. Uh, there are other types of two-engine vehicles. We've got uh, pump trucks, uh, um, drills. They're not uh, anything that's not subject to the uh, the public agency and utility rule. And we're not talking about sweepers, okay? Two-engine sweepers. Now, there is another issue with relation to what we're calling a two-engine vehicle, and that is that in order for us to consider it a two-engine vehicle the secondary engine has to have been in integral to the design of the vehicle, which means that it came from the factory with that engine installed, not one that some a mechanic that works for the company put on after the fact to help them do something that you know, they want to do with that truck. It, it, you think of that as a two-engine vehicle because you're driving around the secondary engine, but it's not a two-engine vehicle. In that case, the main engine is going to be in the on-road regulation, <coughs> and then the secondary engine is going to fall under the portable regulations. Okay. All right, let's get this all out here. Um, for two engine vehicles that are in our rule, both of them have to comply with whatever the standard is uh, in the off-road regulation. And we'll talk about the standards in just a, a little bit, but both engines fall under the requirements of the regulation. Both engines have to be registered with our DOORS reporting system. Both engines have to be labeled with the appropriate equipment identification number, which again, I'll show you a little bit later. And because we're in San Diego, I'm going to encourage, if you're not in San Diego even, I'm going to encourage you if, you, if you have these kind of vehicles, to talk to the local district, because they will tell you one way or another whether your particular circumstance requires a secondary permit. All right, there are some exemptions. Even though trains are considered off-highway or off-road or non-road, whichever terminology you want to use, we don't have any ability to regulate them in the state of California. Why? Because trains are interstate commerce. 
They're strictly, that's just like airplanes. Airplanes are interstate commerce. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have any control at all because we actually have two or three different memorandums of understanding which are contracts with some of the bigger train companies where they have actually given us permission to regulate their vehicles that are in California. It's very minimal. The only two things that we have in these agreements are number one, we can uh, cite them if they're idling too long, and number two, when, uh, there's a requirement that whenever they get new equipment, that comes to California first rather than somewhere else. They replace their old stuff here first. And, and all the memorandums of understanding I know of for locomotives are that way. Marine engines. We have specific uh, issues with marine engines, but the only control we have is when they're actually in our port, when they're in our waters. Outside our California coastal waters, they're under international control. We have absolutely no ability. In fact, you, you can see this if you happen to go far enough off the coast. You'll see boats that are just pouring out tons and tons of coal black smoke because they're running really dirty oil when they're out in international waters. There's no requirement for them not to. Once they get into California waters, you'll see the emissions go down because they switched fuels. And when they're in port, we actually are going through processes right now, where we, I don't know if it's happening in San Diego, I'm sure it is, where we require them to plug into shore power while they're in port. Because one of those boats, one of those tanker trucks or tanker boats can actually burn more than a million gallons a week of diesel fuel just to stay in port. So shore power is the way to go for us. Um, Off-road and recreational vehicles, uh, personal use vehicles are not part of this regulation. This brings up another point that I, I had a discussion with somebody um, at another one of my classes, and that is that what if you have a tractor and you use it for your personal property and your neighbor asks you to do some work and says he's going to pay you for it? Are you commercial now? Yeah, you're commercial now. You're being paid to do something with that piece of equipment. So technically, you fall under this regulation. It's no longer a personal use vehicle. Now, there's little chance that we're going to find out about that. But I say this because there have been a couple of cases where we have found out about it. And just so you understand how that happens, uh, the cases that I'm thinking of were specifically, an, uh, there was a gentleman or a person in a neighborhood that was doing work for several neighbors and he was causing a lot of dust issues. Somebody complained about it. Where do the air complaints go to? They go to one of two places, either the local district or our office. As soon as it goes to an air pollution related agency, the health and safety code, which we run by, which runs us, forces us to investigate. And as soon as we investigate, there's a commercial operation. That means that person has to register, label, and comply with the standard. Not a good deal if you have a personal use um, a vehicle. Okay. Tactical support equipment. We do have some military bases down here. Um, we don't usually have a problem with them. Typically, they, uh, if, well, recently, I should say, the uh, federal government has directed their military bases to comply with all standards that we have. It used to be they didn't think they had to because they were feds and were state, but we have authority and we are enforcing these rules on the federal government and the military operations. The point for us is to try di to differentiate between what is tactical and what's not. And anything that can be used for tactical support, we pretty much, that's exempt. Okay. Operational vehicles like tanks, obviously, half tracks, things like that. Uh, the stuff that we do look at are the, the vehicles that are used throughout the bases that are just hauling goods from one place to another or personnel from one place to another. Um, for, forklifts that are using in uh, warehouse operations. None of that is really considered tactical support. Those fall under this regulation. Okay. Two engine sweepers, <coughs> currently exempt. And there's a couple different, those are going to fall under the... Um, on-road regulation or the public agency and utility regulation. Port equipment. So um, has anybody here ever been on a port? You have? You're all over the place. I used to work at port. <laughs> <laughs> she works at an airport. She used to work at a, a, a Port, of Los, Port of Los Angeles. Okay. Hmm. Anyway, if you ever get the chance to go on the port, what you'll notice is obviously a bunch of trucks hauling containers. But you'll also notice a large number of vehicles moving stuff around on the port. There'll be forklifts, there'll be tow tractors, there'll be all kinds of equipment. A lot of it's diesel. That stuff, uh, 
is hard to regulate because again it's encapsulated it's always staying on the port it doesn't come off the port so we actually have a, a rule the, called the cargo handling rule that specifically focuses on those type of vehicles operating on ports or rail yards because they're specific to that location even though normally they would fall under this rule we put them under the cargo handling rule all right let me go this um, back up here low use we'll talk about low use more later but for purposes of this rule if you can keep any a vehicle that ha meets the five requirements to be under this rule under 200 hours per year that vehicle is considered low use and it's just it's it's exempt at that point from any of the requirements of the regulation emergency vehicles this is common through all of our regulations emergency vehicles are almost always exempt dedicated snow removal vehicles I doubt you have any of those down here in San Diego County but you know there are a number of them throughout the state and the thing we do here or we, we make sure here is that we're not talking about somebody that has put a plow on the front of a truck these are vehicles that were built from the factory with the plow or snow removal mechanism built as part of the vehicle they are exempt from this regulation now the main reason for this um, it goes back to because originally they were under the rule the main reason goes back to filtration systems what temperature do filtration systems like to operate does anybody know is that hot or cold hot hot, hot. the hotter they get to a certain level the better they work a snow removal vehicle does not really produce a lot well it has it does produce heat but the problem is that it's in snow so there's a problem trying to keep the filtration systems clean they just don't work very well in those circumstances so we didn't make the requirement that they had to have them all right um, anything used the majority of the time in agro do we have anybody using ag vehicles here we get a lot of farmers applying for Carl Moyer okay well uh, I'll be talking about that in just a few in a little bit but for ag purposes anything that's used more than 50 percent for production of crops is considered exempt from this regulation and you say how do we determine that 50 percent well if you're going to designate something as an ag vehicle we're going to require you to put an hours meter on that vehicle we're going to require you to report the hours meter readings on an annual basis and you're gonna, we're going to require you to differentiate between those ag purpose and non ag hours so that you can demonstrate that it's more than 50 percent of the time being used for ag if it is it's exempt if it's not it's part of the regulation and then funding for this rule might apply now we also have programs uh, dealing with funding because we at some at one point uh, at least two or three years ago we were in the process of creating a regulation that deals just with farm equipment and we canned that idea as we implemented the truck and bus regulation I don't know if you guys are aware of how difficult the truck and bus rule has been to implement how many problems people have had with it but the ag rule was going to be even more severe than that as far as our, our part was so we decided to to can the idea of having a thou shalt rule and we're going to a uh, incentive based approach where we're trying to get people to turn equipment over by offering money and funds okay all right <clears throat> now I'm gonna ask you a few questions you already have the answers this is just for review what size is the cutoff for a single engine vehicle in the off-road regulation 25 horsepower so anything 25 horsepower or greater falls under this regulation what should you check to confirm that your vehicle is truly off-road your your emission control label that's where you find the engine family now I'll also offer this to anybody that has a problem finding their label first of all if you can't find the label the only place you can get a label replacement first it also back up first of all it's a violation not to have the label on the vehicle on the engine second of all if you don't have the label and you need to get a new one the only place you can get it is at a representative manufacturer's representative the dealership okay third they have to apply it they're not going to send you the label to apply because they're not legally allowed to do that then people would be putting them on anything and anywhere they have to be applied to the correct part of the engine by somebody that knows where it goes and it has to go on the engine that is for okay um, if you can't find your family name ARB has a database an online database you have access to it everybody does anybody with an online uh, a portal can get to it the problem is that it's not very easy to find and it's somewhat difficult to navigate just like most of our web pages are somewhat difficult to navigate uh, if you have a problem and you need help I can look through this database fairly quickly 
to determine what your family name is because this is a database of what are called executive orders. So I told you the federal government certifies all new engines. California was certifying engines before the federal government did. We had a sister program. We still kept it going, so we still operate this. So even though the feds certify all engines, we have an executive order that has to be produced for them to be sold in California. And that executive order has the family names. It, I would need uh, the model year of the, what the engine is, what the horsepower rating is, manufacturer, and um, displacement. Those four pieces of information can, you can find almost any executive order in our, our database. <clears throat> How many criteria uh, does the other type of two engine vehicle have to meet to be subject to this regulation? It's five. The auxiliary engine has to be greater or equal to 50 horsepower. Certified engine, at least tier one. Not subject to the uh, public agency and utility regulation. That's the city, state, and uh, county rule. Not a street sweeper. And the auxiliary engine is integrated into the design of the vehicle. Okay. That actually trips most people up. Because most people would think that they're... That They've never used that second engine for anything other than what that vehicle does. It's integrated into the design. But if you go back and look, it's just an engine or something that was bolted in place. It wasn't built at the factory that way. All right, let's talk about the requirements. This rule is a little bit different in that in order to determine where you fit, <clears throat> you have to determine the size of your fleet. <coughs> And the way we want you to do that, the way you do that is, and this, this is my best advice, it, if you don't know how to run Excel, learn how to run Excel, or the Google uh, equivalent of that. Create an Excel spreadsheet that has four tabs, one for each of the styles of engines. So one for off-road, one for on-road, one for stationary, and one for portable. Put all of your equipment in there in one of these four tabs, and the information for off-road for that tab you want, at minimum, the horsepower rating of that engine. Why am I saying that? Because the way you calculate where you fit in this rule is you take all of your off-road, off-highway, you know, whatever you want to call it, engines and vehicles, and you add all their max horsepower ratings to get a single number. You don't want to have any of your on-road stuff in there. You don't want any of your portable stuff in there. You don't want anything other than the off-road engines in there get a single number, and then compare it to a chart. I'm going to show you in just a second. Uh, exclude, exclude certain equipment. You want to exclude the stuff that's exempt. So if you have stuff you're going to designate as low use, don't include it in that number. If you have stuff that's going to be emergency, don't include it in that number. Uh, dedicate anything that's on the exemption list, don't include it in that single number you get. Once you get that number, <coughs> you look and see where you fit as far as one of the three types of fleet sizes. It's either small, medium, or large. So all small fleets are less than or equal to 2,500 total horsepower. There's also a category in here called captive attainment fleets. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But uh, it's a different way to consider a fleet as, uh, as small. And believe me, if you can, you want your fleet to be small. Not that I don't want anybody to have a lot of business but the small fleet requirements are further away. You don't have to do anything right now. And you have a longer period of time to comply. So it's into your benefit if you're a small fleet. Medium fleets are anything from 2501 up to and including 5,000 total horsepower, and anything over 5,000 horsepower is considered large. If it's a federal government or state fleet, automatically large, okay? There are, or is, a, uh, actually I think I'll bring it up here. Yeah, captive attainment areas. You've got an extra slide in your handout that shouldn't be there. The, the map of the California state that has all the green on it, just put an X through it because that map is wrong. I don't know why I included it in there. I want you to look at the other map. Because um, in the state of California, we monitor our air con constantly. We have mo this agency here has monitoring sites throughout San Diego County. The state has monitoring sites throughout the California. Every local district has at least one monitoring site. The federal government puts monitoring sites. They all measure air 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. 
what they're doing is trying to determine what the constituents of the air people are breathing, as far as pollutants are concerned, have in them. That's called our ambient air. Okay? They set standards on what, can, what pollutants have to be at, what level they have to be at in the ambient air in order for a particular county to be considered in attainment. If it's in attainment, you're awesome. You don't have to worry about doing anything. You're in attainment for that pollutant. So uh, legislatively and regulatory wise, you don't have to write any rules to control that particular pollutant. In our state, for the most part, we're not in attainment for a lot of the pollutants that the federal government wants us to be in attainment for. But if you look at the, the uh, county map, the ones uh, shown, let me get here, on this map, everything in blue, when this rule was first put in place, they were in attainment for NOx, federal NOx of standards for ambient air quality. What did I say this rule was based on, NOx or PM? NOx. This is a NOx-based rule. So if the counties are in attainment for NOx, do you think that they should get a benefit? The answer is absolutely yes. I mean, we want to we reduce particulate and NOx, so they're still going to have to do something. But because they're in attainment for NOx, we're going to make them do less or we're going to give them more time. One of those two things. So if you happen to have a fleet, now San Diego's not in here, but if you happen to have a fleet that actually exists in the, non the captive attainment areas and they stay in those areas, that's what the captive part means they're automatically, they can be automatically designated as a small fleet, regardless of what their horsepower total is. Does that make sense? Okay, good. All right. Any questions on that? I'm, I'm, yes? Uh, we have some fleets that are in Santa Barbara and Monterey, but I have them in our overall fleet, because I never know if they're going to move around. Is that okay? Like, I don't do anything special. Okay, well, uh, everybody hear what she's asking. They have, she works for a statewide company. And she controls the, or well, deals with the air pollution issues all over the state. So they have some fleets in Santa Barbara and Monterey, which are both in the captive attainment area. Okay, um, the answer is you could, if you knew that the vehicles were going to stay strictly in those areas, you could designate that one small part as, you know, small fleet as far as how it complies. But the way you're doing it is not wrong. Yeah, it's too risky. Yeah. I never know. Yeah, you, if you have the inkling that anything at all is ever going to come out of there, I wouldn't do it. Okay. Because here's the deal. Yes, you get a benefit for being in a uh, captive attainment area. You're considered small fleet. But if you take a vehicle that's designated that way out of those areas, you're automatically in violation of this regulation. And you, you can get a citation for having a vehicle outside those areas for anything other than repair work. Okay. All right. Um, that's what we deal with fleet portions. This rule allows you to do kind of what we were discussing right here, where if you have multiple locations throughout the state and some exist strictly in the captive attainment fleet areas, you can, even though you cannot calculate your total fleet size without adding their horsepowers to yours so to determine whether you're large, medium, or whether the whole fleet is, if you have an encapsulated air a group in the captive attainment areas, that particular location can comply with the rule using the small fleet parameters while the rest of your fleet has to use whatever the fleet size designates. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, good. Anybody not have a problem or anybody have a problem with that? I almost did a double negative. Anybody not have a problem with it, okay? All right. <coughs> they still have to follow the uh, timelines that are determined by the overall fleet size unless they're in the captive attainment area. If you have any issues with this, again, because San Diego's not in there, I'm going to say it's probably not going to apply to most of you, but if you have issues with this and any particular um, questions that, that I can't answer today or TN can't answer today, I'm going to give you some contact information at the end of this class that goes directly to the off-road group and they will make a determination okay, and help you through that. Let's do an example. Okay, so I have a fleet that has three operations, one in Southern California, one in Central, one in Northern California. There are the fleet sizes right there. The question is, what is the size of each portion? They're all large, okay? Now what if we put, they're all large, what if Fleet C is in a captive attainment area? It's considered small, even though their horsepower rating is, puts it in the medium category, 
even though their company horsepower rating puts it in the large category, they're considered small because they're strictly in the captive attainment area. So portions A and B have to follow the large timeline, but portion C could follow the small timeline. Okay? The rule has that flexibility built into it. So how do you go about, do you have to go about registering your fleet like that? Or? Yeah, you have to, when you register, they have to be designated as captive attainment. There's a section in the reporting system for that. Indoors? Yes. Yeah. There's a selection. So what if I didn't do it? I am definitely following that category. What if I didn't do it originally? Not because I didn't know. Uh, you should be able, they should be able to change that, right, in the system? Does this go with specified time? You can go and designate. So I, I forgot to do this. You're supposed to be up here when you answer those questions. <laughs> so th there's no specified uh, timeline to do it, so you can actually just do it in your account. So if you go on the owner information page, mm -hmm. there's just a question where it asks if you're a captive attainment area for That's how you would designate it. In the owner information? Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Randy, I was going to ask you one thing. Uh, do we discuss more about the uh, ownerships and our owners? And uh, We've come across a couple of uh, companies which um, are owned by you know, a larger company, and technically they should have been reporting the entire fleet size. You know, right. It's large, but there was some confusion there about... So we, we had this question come up yesterday. Basically, you'll have companies, large companies, that are more or less the... Um, the parent company of a bunch of smaller ver versions of that company. And you're wondering whether or not the, the smaller versions or smaller entities can comply with individual fleet size portions of this rule based on their own fleet size, correct? Is that what you're having an issue with? Correct, yeah, how, they should, how should they be? So the answer comes with exactly how the parent company um, controls those entities. If they're making the purchasing decisions and the, the uh, any of the regular day-to-day -day maintenance decisions, uh, fuel purchases, maintenance, uh, purchasing new vehicles, any of that kind of decision, if that's coming down from the parent company, then the entire fleet has to comply with the whole, whatever the large or the fleet size is for the whole company. Common In order to... Common control and ownership. Yes, common control and ownership. But thank you very much. Uh, that's how we determine it. Right? If you have for uh, a parent company that is just a, a figurehead, but each individual spot controls everything that happens at their individual spot, then they could possibly be designated as a portion and uh, comply with the rule based on their fleet size at that portion. Any other questions related to that? Okay, All right. So what if you uh, rent or lease equipment? This is actually very common under this uh, program, uh, this type of equipment. Many people don't own this equipment because it can be extremely expensive to purchase. So we lease or rent these, these type of vehicles. Um, the, the way this rule is written, <clears throat> if the term of the contract is less than a year, then the company that's leasing the vehicle is responsible for that vehicle. They have to include it in their fleets. They have to comply with the, f the fleet rule uh, with that vehicle in their fleet. If the term of the lease is more than a year or a year or greater, then it has to be specified in the contract who's going to include it in their fleet. It could be either, but it has to be specified in the contract. Now, why would you want to include a vehicle that you're leasing in your fleet, as far as compliance is concerned? Maybe a cleaner vehicle. Huh? It most uh, definitely is going to be a cleaner vehicle. If you go around the state, and I've, I've done this before, you go around the state and talk to all the lease rental companies of this kind of equipment, they don't keep old stuff around. And once it gets to a certain age, they sell it somewhere. In fact, the larger companies like Cat or Cummins or something like that, Cat is a, big, a good example. Once it gets past seven or eight years, or a number of hours, whatever it happens to be, they're moving that stuff out of the country. Okay? They don't keep it here in the United States, especially not California. Yeah. Question, what if the renter comes across enforcement for idling? Does that ticket go to the renter or to the Okay, owner? very good question. We haven't got to the idling portion yet, but since you asked, I'll bring that up. There is an off-road idling limitation of five minutes of non-essential idling for these type of vehicles. I'll talk about it more and a couple of other things later, but to answer your question, um, the, the off-road regulation um, has a stipulation that the owner of the equipment is the one that actually pays or has to deal with the citation. However, for a leased piece of equipment, we consider the person, the company leasing it to be that entity that we would charge. 
or give the citation to. So we're not going to go back to CAT if they leased a piece of equipment to you and you're the one that's eyeing them. We're going to go to you. Okay. Does that make sense? as a safeguard, um, companies should maybe put that in the contract as well? You mean the I Well, the CAT, the CAT does. Okay. They already do that. So, so we, do that. we put it in our contract? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the CYA. Uh, they cover your own self, I mean, basically. All right, so um, we've talked about this. If you have a long-term lease that started before this date, June 15th of 2008, we pretty much consider that to be part of your fleet. You have to report it as part of your fleet. It doesn't matter what the contract says. You've had that for, what is that now, almost 10 years, okay? It's your, it's your vehicle. Um, the administrative requirements. Now we're going to get to idling. Okay. I already talked about what the idling limitation is. Five minutes of non-essential idling. Can anybody define for me what essential is? To run an air conditioner if it's hot out or a heater if it's cold out. That's not essential. It is for OSHA. Okay, we'd have an argument there with OSHA. <laughs> okay. Cab comfort, according to the state, our, reg our, our idling limitations, are not considered essential. If it's for a heat or, stre or a heat or cold emergency, then it's considered essential. But just for cab comfort, that's not. And that works for on-road, off-road, and school bus idling. So that just depends on the temperature outside? Well, it depends. No, it doesn't depend on the temperature outside. It depends on the status of the operator. If you have an operator that is sick because it's too hot or sick because their, their legs are freezing off, do whatever you have to to get them hot or cold or whatever the case may be. But just to maintain their comfort level while they're operating the machinery is not considered an exemption from the idling limitation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, that's it. Some time they're repairing it, right? If they're repairing. Oh, well, that's an exemption. Right. If they're doing, uh, there are exemptions to the idling limitation. Uh, but let's go back to what's essential. Essential, uh, as defined, basically under the rule is if the machine is performing its intended function and idling is part of that function, that's essential idling. So uh, there are times when idling is part of the function of a vehicle. If you're in a queue, everybody know what a queue is? It's a line of vehicles waiting to pick something up or drop something off. It could be a single vehicle, but they're, they're waiting for another vehicle to load them or to unload them. That is a, a actual legitimate use for a vehicle where they can idle. Okay. Um, if you're doing repairs, you've got a mechanic who needs the thing to idle so they can determine what's going on with the engine or something related to the equipment, that's an essential function. If idling to run a power takeoff device is necessary and you're using the power takeoff device for whatever its function is, that's considered essential. There's all manner of different ways that that can be considered essential. There's another one that many people don't think of and that is in many cases for this type of equipment, the manufacturer specifies that you uh, are required, or unless you want to damage the equipment, you're required to leave that vehicle idling for startup and cool down for a given period of time before you operate it or after you operate it. So I've seen 20 minutes, I've seen 30 minutes. Uh, I've never seen anything past 30 minutes, but that means that because the manufacturer says this thing has to run for 20 or 30 minutes before you do anything, before you engage it, Otherwise, you risk damaging the engine. That is considered essential idling, okay, so for purposes of this regulation. Now, this, this rule also has two other parts of the idling. One is a sales, disclo uh, a sales disclosure, and the other is an idling policy. The idling policy only applies, let me get to it. The idling policy only applies to large and medium companies. If you're a small company, you do not have this requirement. But essentially what the rule requires is that if you're in that large or medium category, you're required to have a policy, a written policy in place that directs your operators and employees against doing non-essential idling. Most companies have this as a form that they have their uh, operators and, and guys sign uh, during the safety tailgate talks or when they first get hired and then they keep it as a file in their personnel file. Uh, we don't write that. We, we can give you some um, advice on how to write it, but it's going to be individualized per company, so we don't write those for you. Yes? 
I keep getting asked by some of my people, is, are they talking about putting in an idling policy for gasoline power vehicles? No. No, uh, that's not, the idling limitation, uh, you're talking about commercial vehicle idling, and uh, that's not going to be modified. To the best of my knowledge, it's, it's done, it's, they're not adding that. No gasoline, no propane, anything like that? Not to the best of my knowledge, no. Okay. Uh, it wouldn't be gasoline anyway, because the idling limitation for commercial vehicles is diesel vehicles only. Unless you're near a school. Then it's any fuel, but, yeah. Um, so we'll talk about all these. Let's talk about, we did the idling limitation, so I'm going to go past this. Um, the idling policy, I do have a, a link in your documentation right there that you can follow that gives you some advice on how to write one. Again, it's not going to write it for you, but it's advice on how to write it and what it should include. The sales disclosure. We're not saying that if you sell a vehicle, you have to make that vehicle compliant or you have to include it in your fleet. What we're saying in this particular case is that if you're going to sell a vehicle to somebody else that's going to operate it in California, you have to include a phrase or paragraph of text that we do give you that essentially warns the person who's buying it that there's a regulation that is covered by that, that vehicle is covered by. I know this isn't perp training, but do you know does that apply for perp as well? Uh, PERP is going through a, well, PERP is a registration program, so no. The um, ATCM on diesel portable is going through a regulatory change, or it just is, so I'm not sure if they're adding that, but I don't remember that being part of it. Okay. You are aware that they're changing the, uh, okay, so. That's yes. sales disclosure, that's the entire doors regulation, uh, not just the island? It's the entire doors regulation. Any vehicle that falls under this regulation, if you own it and you're selling it to somebody that's going to operate in California, you have to include, and I've got it right here, let's see, that's the text you have to include. Is there um, like a date as to when that disclosure should have been inserted into the disclosure, like it's like a year? 2007. Okay. Uh, because here's, this, this, I'm glad you brought this up because what did I say about the difference between our ability to enforce the rule between the state and the feds? The feds didn't allow us to do anything until 2010. However, that was only on the emissions-related components. Okay. The idling and the uh, sales disclosure are not emission-related components necessarily, so we were, in, and the labeling, we were enforcing all three of those from 2007 on. Okay. Okay? This sales disclosure has to be included in your documentation. Let me get this back up here. Um, for, and kept for three years. <coughs> because many of the vehicles that fall under this rule when they're sold go to auction and you don't necessarily know where they're going to, whether it's in state or out of state, my advice and our advice is to, to make sure that the auction house includes this in their language. And I will tell you that most of them already do. Right? Everyone that I've ever been to ha already does. But just retain a copy of it for three years. The only time this is going to come up is if you get an audit from us. And that's not terribly common. I'll talk about audits a little bit later. But it is something that happens. If you ever get a citation from us, I can guarantee you that your fleet's going to be audited. But there are also random audits that can happen as well. Okay. All right. So follow on to that. If somebody sells you something and didn't disclose it, and you find out that you have a vehicle that's not legal for use in California. Well, there may be a suit there. But that's not, we're not going to fight that suit for you. That's something you'd have to do on a private level. You could use that as part of the reasoning for this, the case, because it is state law. All right, All right so initial reporting. <clears throat> there are two, two types of reporting slash registration associated with this rule. This says initial reporting. I prefer the term registration. And that means that, or what it is, is we're asking any vehicle that falls under the rule, that means, meets the five definitions of what falls under the rule, and I'll ask you for those in just a minute, um, has to be in the door system. Okay, so let's go through those five. In California, running diesel, off-road, 25 horsepower or greater, true off-road, um, self-propelled, that was the other one. 
So if it meets those five conditions, it's under this rule. And if it's not already reported, it's out of compliance. The only way that it cannot be out of compliance is if you got it, you, you've only had it for less than 30 days. Okay? Otherwise, it's out of compliance already. Does that mean that we're coming after you? No. We don't do that. There's no fine for reporting for registering late. We would rather everything were registered, so just register it. Technically speaking, it's out of compliance, but you're not going to get a citation. We, we just want you to put it in the system. That's as much for um, inventory as it is for the regulatory purposes. Okay? Knowing what we actually have in our state is important for us to determine whether or not this rule is actually doing anything. Okay? <clears throat> you report using DOORS, and they don't like me. Uh, it's not an acronym anymore. Just so you know, this used to be the diesel off-road online reporting system, but this, they've taken that part away because now it includes LSI. So it's just called DOORS, same program. If you've been in there, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's accessible via the, via the, the internet. Uh, it compli compiles and retains the data, and the door system is very robust. It actually does all the calculations necessary for you. You don't have to do any math at all. Just put your vehicles in there with the appropriate information, and the system will tell you this, that you're in compliance or this is what you can do to, to get in compliance. It'll give you those, those options. We'll look at that in just a minute. Um, our system doesn't currently validate the data, so it really relies upon you putting the correct information in there. Now, anybody here that has to deal with the truck and bus truckers reporting system may be aware that over time that system has had validation points built into it. I'll give you an example. For the, the truck and bus system has been in operation and taking uh, data since 2010. 2010 to 2014 in the field for family name you could put anything. You could put question marks, you could cuss us out, you could put anything. And as long as there was something there, the system would allow you to report and save the data. And a lot of people input information that was not family name information. They put serial numbers or NA or whatever. And starting in 2015, the programmers of that system put a validation um, program as part of the reporting system. And now, if it's not the family name that is associated with the manufacturer, the model, the horsepower rating, and everything, it's not going to let you save the data. Now, uh, Tien, do you know if they're going to be putting that functionality in, in doors? Thank you. <coughs> you know, just like Randy said, it's, it's really important that you do report correct information. There, there are validations in place, but doors, you know, your, your compliance calculations, it's going to be based on what's reported. So. You know, some of the common situations that we run into is, you know, just with the fleet size, you know, a company, they'll sell off a bunch of their equipment. So at one point, they look like a large fleet, but, you know, they're actually a small fleet, but they don't come in maybe a year, a couple months later to update the information. So it's like Randy said, it's really imperative that you enter in update and correct information. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, you're probably already aware of this, too, but our enforcement division, our enforcement officers, have access to the data that's in doors. They have uh, live access to it, but what they normally do is before they go out into the field, they actually download a, a picture, if you will, a snapshot of what the data is to their laptop or to their phone, or they download it to um, a system where they can access it through their phone, and they go out into the field and look to see that what's in the system matches what they're looking at. Enforcement has pretty much live data, right? <clears throat> if you miss the deadline, I already said there's no, uh, there's no penalties for reporting late. Just get as much of the information in there as you can, as, as quickly as you can. This is the uh, reporting portal for doors. Okay. Um, can't do that much here. You can create an account. You can log in. You can recover your password. You can... Uh, get data or, or help on how to report, what to report, facts, FAQs, all kinds of information. But really, this is just a portal for getting into the door system. Now, um, if you click on the information, uh, the Fleet Reporting, the Knowledge Center, this is what you're going to get. 
okay? The Knowledge Center has reporting forms. It has free training. I don't know if we have any videos up there, but um, there are links to training courses like this. Uh, there are uh, re the language of the regulation, which I'm not encouraging anybody to actually read unless you've got a couple of afternoons um, or a couple of days, <laughs> but it's there. And uh, you can actually find it in a couple different forms. If you like reading the strikeout versions, uh, that's there as well, because all the, all the different versions are there. Um, but that's available to you. We get to this. All right, so um, the reporting system is open all the time. But what, what Tien was saying is absolutely true, and that is as your fleet changes, it's legally required that you update it within 30 days of a change or at least once a year is what we would absolutely like to see. The problem with not updating it is exactly what I said about enforcement. If our enforcement guys are looking at your data and it says that you're a large fleet but you're actually not a large fleet because you've made changes and they're not seeing something out in the field that should be done to a large fleet, you're liable to get a citation or have questions asked even though it's not due to you because you've changed your fleet size. So it's in your best interest to keep that information up to date as much as possible. Yes, sir. I was going to have one thing, too, that we've <coughs> seen recently is that there'll, there'll have been, or there is a recent ownership change, and the previous owner will report the sale, but the person who bought the vehicle or the company that bought the vehicle did not uh, go in and report or add the vehicle to their fleet. Yeah, that actually, it actually goes both ways. So if you sell or remove or retire a vehicle, you've got 30 days to make that change in the system, take it out of your fleet. Uh, the person who buys it has 30 days to enter it into their fleet, and if one or the other parties doesn't do that, then the information is inaccurate. If the seller doesn't do it, the buyer can't enter anything because the information is already in the system in somebody else's fleet, and the system does validate. They won't let you duplicate a vehicle. If it's got the same EIN number, it's not going to be able to be added to your fleet if it's not released by the other fleet. Okay, so that's another thing that's in this part. We there is, and actually this came up yesterday at uh, we were at Cat, um, because Cat sells vehicles all the time, right? Used vehicles, new vehicles. What they did was they actually uh, what the gentleman that I deal with there told me that there are. He used the term tons, but uh, he said hundreds, maybe thousands of vehicles that are exactly what you're describing where they were sold by him, his company, they removed them from their fleet list, and they've never been added to, to the other organization or company's fleet list. That's a problem for us, and it's a problem for them if we actually do enforcement out in the field. Because if it's in no man's land, it's not in the CATS fleet, it's not in the, the new operator's fleet, we're forced to write a citation to whoever's operating that vehicle. And, and that's, that could be a problem because it could have, could have gone to a rental agency and they just didn't add it to their fleet and now the person who rented the vehicle is going to be do, uh, getting a citation. Creates a major headache. What do you, what do, you do if you purchase a, a piece of equipment and it has a EIN number on it and you can't get the guy to um, purchase it? You, you call the uh, hotline for the doors system because they have the ability to actually make that happen without the release. Okay. They, they, can, they can do that for you. Yeah. I know. Uh, that happens, you, they can bypass that as long as it's, it can be demonstrated that, that was actually what happened. Yeah. Is there a way to call the doors hotline and find out if the vehicle that got sold does, did have an EIN? So you bought a vehicle that didn't have a label on it and you want to know if... Uh, that's a good question. It has uh, family names and they have serial numbers that are required and um, I'm not sure. I'm, uh, Tien, do you know? I'm making them do work today. Can you, can you repeat that question? You got a vehicle that got bought a couple of years ago. Right. Doesn't have an EIN, but you want to find out if maybe they just removed it before they sold it to you. I mean, we, we can check the database. We check for the vehicle serial number, the engine serial number. Okay. Um, so there are some kind of factors or identifiers we can look in, but you have to keep in mind some of the manufacturers. I mean, there's no set format for some of these serial numbers. So Whatever their serial number is, you know, it can come up multiple times in other fleets for other vehicles as well. But we can definitely check the database. Okay. Thanks. 
Right. I just want to say this is probably where the disconnect happens between the customer and between dealerships. Uh -huh. We run into this a lot, especially with on-road grants. A lot of people don't even know what Truckers is, uh -huh. the on-road right. reporting system. <coughs> Doors as well. I mean, I don't know if it's if just a suggestion, if it becomes maybe the responsibility of the dealership to kind of school them on. This okay, so uh, you... Uh, you uh, ask, are asking a question that came up yesterday when talking to Jeff Wood of Cat. Okay. I think they do a really good job. Yeah, but he was adamantly opposed to that. And the reason he was adamantly opposed, and I, I actually understand it, is because of the onus uh, that they already have based on the number of regulations they have to deal with. You're adding one more paperwork step that they have to deal with, and they don't want to do it. And they're not going to do it unless they're actually forced by rule of law to do it. It's a suggestion. I know it's already been up in Sacramento. I don't know if it's going to change, but that's the industry um, perception, if you will. We've got to find a way around it because the, the bad data indoors affects how we can enforce the rule, and it affects grants, obviously. But for grant purposes, if somebody's trying to get a grant, uh, you kind of make them do it yeah, at that point. So. Even if it's their first time hearing about it. Right. I had someone call like yesterday, didn't even know. It's yeah. a school district, too. I guess I'm not traveling enough. <laughs> Seems like the sales disclosure would be good enough mm -hmm. on Cats In. Yeah, but the sales disclosure might be on the third page back of one of the pages of the contract, and they'd say, you've got all this language you've got to read, and the person never reads it. Sales disclosure will be purchasing department and yeah. maintenance department, they don't talk. Yeah, if it if it it's got to be there, but it doesn't mean the person buying it has to actually read it. Yeah. You know, but there there is a disconnect as he's she's talking about. Yeah, because I know we've experienced it. Cause we sell a lot of equipment. Uh, I always make it known that you can only do so much on the right. Well, I appreciate that you do that, but there's still a disconnect. I don't know that there's any way to completely fix it. Uh, uh, like you said, unless it becomes a requirement. Right. Upon and I, I, I can tell you right now that the heavy hitters and the bigger companies are, they will fight tooth and nail not to have that happen. Okay. Anyway, <coughs> we've, we've, uh, we've gone quite a ways on this. Let's, let's keep going. All right. Um, if, you, if you need hard copy forms, they are available. Uh, all of our systems have hard copy forms. The thing that I would say about hard copy forms is that I don't recommend them only because you submit hard copy forms, somebody from our office has to try and interpret your handwriting and enter it into the system. And that can be a problem in and of itself. But also on top of that, we have to notify you of what we put in there and your ability to access the information is, is less and it's more difficult unless you're doing it online and keeping the login information yourself. <clears throat> The doors, the doors hotline is available anytime you want. Well, I shouldn't say anytime. You can't call them at midnight. But uh, generally speaking, it's 8 to 5. There should be somebody there during the week. Uh, we don't force anybody to work on weekends unless there's something major going on. But uh, you, you can generally get a hold of somebody. What I would tell you is that uh, if, you, if you have a basic reporting question or basic question related to the program, the, the doors hotline is absolutely perfect. The uh, people that answer that phone are air techs, which uh, means they're not full staff people. That doesn't mean they don't know what they're talking about. They deal with this all the time and they're very knowledgeable on it. But if you have a, a strange circumstance or a complicated issue, the only person or people that are going to be able to deal with that are full staff people that are experts with the rule. If you want to go direct to them, I would suggest you send an email because those generally go to the, uh, the staff people. <clears throat> okay. This is what the door system looks like when you log in. Uh, you will have your doors ID, your fleets listed there. You'll notice that there are some, some new boxes. We've got the Off-Road Diesel Knowledge Center as well as the LSI Diesel Knowledge Center, or LSI, not diesel, but the LSI Knowledge Center because we've incorporated LSI into the doors reporting system. Uh, so you, you could have uh, multiple fleets and if you have LSI fleets they will be color coded with blue uh, instead of green in this list okay and you can have as many fleets as you want under your particular account 
Uh, the compliance snapshot is something that most people in, uh, that have DOORS accounts should be aware of because it is something that will help you understand what we're looking at, right? We can only make determinations based on what you input into the system. We're not entering stuff for you. So when you put your information in there, we created this compliance snapshot specifically so that you could see what we're seeing. We've, we'll, we'll show you how many vehicles we see reported. We'll show you uh, the total horsepower <coughs> of your fleet. Uh, there are several pages in here. If you have any credits, uh, the compliance summary, what your fleet average is based on the report, the fleet size that you've reported, what the requirements are, whether you're in compliance, all these things will be shown in the compliance snapshot. So it's a very useful tool. Um, there is a, a credit summary that's also in here if you haven't looked at this. There are several credits that are associated with this regulation that anybody that wants to try for a credit has access to. Um, this is something that will help the rest of your fleet comply but we give you a snapshot on what we're seeing. So if you think you have a credit, check this sheet to see that what you're reporting actually shows that credit. Okay. <clears throat> we're going to talk about labeling and then we'll take a short break. Okay. So when you register a vehicle, each vehicle is given an equipment identification number. It's a six digit alphanumeric, could be numbers or letters, it is associated with that particular vehicle for the life of that vehicle. So don't, don't scrape it off, right? We don't create a label for you, we give you the number. You're required to put that label, apply that label on both sides of the vehicle. Now that hasn't always been the case. When the, first, when the rule first came out, it was originally just, the, I believe, the port side of the vehicle. If you know nautical terms, I'm not sure, but usually if when the driver's facing one direction, it's the right-hand side of the vehicle. <clears throat> Why would we have to make it on both sides? Because that was one of the first changes that happened. Yeah, but why? We could see the other side too, but why would we, instead of just saying one side, why would we have to change it so that it has to be both sides? That, that have to do with binoculars and looking over a hillside and which direction the vehicle is going. The last one. Okay, so now why do we want this label, first of all? No, no, it's drive-by enforcement. Okay, we want to give our enforcement officers the ability to be able to go do enforcement without stopping a construction site. If these labels are big enough, that can happen easily. Now, when we first wrote the regulation and required the label on the port side, we had a number of operators that decided at night or whenever to either face their vehicles with a non-label side or park them with the non-label side facing the street because they knew specifically that our purpose was to do drive-by enforcement. Because of that, we had to go back into the rule, which is not an easy thing to do, and we added the requirement for it to be on both sides. <clears throat> so now, if you have a vehicle, it has to be labeled on both sides. There are, um, there's documentation on what the label has to look like, but in most areas of the state, it has to look like what I've got right there. A red background with white block lettering, a minimum of three inches high, as far as the lettering is concerned. You can put it on any way you want. You can paint it, you can stencil it. There are companies that will sell you signs. Uh, we don't make the signs. We just give you the number, okay? Once you register a vehicle, the law actually says you're supposed to put the label on within 30 days, okay? Again, it's unlikely that you're gonna have somebody from enforcement see you within that 30 day period, but to the best of your ability, please get it on as soon as you can. There is another label. And this will go to, to you if you decide to go in a captive attainment area. Because if you're in a captive attainment area and you're going to keep those vehicles in that area and you want to take advantage of the small fleet uh, compliance schedule, you have to label your vehicles different. It has to be green background with white lettering. And again, that's for drive-by enforcement. If I see a green label with white lettering here in San Diego, what's going to happen? Automatic citation. Okay. If I see one in the Central Valley, automatic citation. Anywhere but those captive attainment counties. The only reason you're able to take those out of there legally is to do repair work. that cannot be done in the captive attainment area. And if we find it outside and you have paperwork that demonstrates you're on your way to a repair shop or on your way from a repair shop, you're fine. 
It's just that it's an easy one for us to see, okay? <clears throat> I'll tell you some of the stuff that I have seen. Not recently, but I've been uh, uh, working with this regulation for probably a decade now. Uh, well, near, nearly since it, it came out. Uh, and, and it's like um, that game Slugbug. Once I knew there were labels on these things, I couldn't help but look for them whenever I passed construction sites. So I've seen a lot of different things. Um, I've seen construction sites that have no labels. I've seen construction sites that have some labels, some not. I've seen, I've seen two construction sites that have the same number on every single label. Okay, now I bring that up because I want to give you some, some enforcement perspective. What is the problem with having a job site that has all the same numbers of labels? Cheating. Yeah, they're not reported right. Fraud. Not reported right. All of those. Yeah. They may not, they're probably not reported at all. Because so here, the lower bid. here here's, here's a company that knows there's a regulation. They know there's a requirement. They're just too stupid to go all the way in to find out what the requirement actually is and try and cheat right if there is a way to cheat right. Okay, for an enforcement person, when I see that, I am going for whatever the max penalty is that I can associate with a citation for that. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but an equipment citation is $1,000. That's uh, legally on a per day per violation basis. Our enforcement division's policy is $1,000 a month. Okay? But if I found a construction site that had 30 vehicles on it, all the same number, I'm going to go back and I'm going to find out when they were on that site and I'm going to take every day that they were on that site and I'm going to count the number of vehicles that were on that site and I'm going to go $1,000 per day per vehicle and write a citation for that amount. So in your view that's worse than if you go there and there's none on the site? Because none on the site might be able to argue ignorance? It is worse to me because that's an intent. And I can sort of understand the no label thing. I can't understand the no label label combination as well. But the all the same number is definitely intent. There is some gray area otherwise. Okay? And that's the way I would look at it. All right. Uh, let's see. Specifications and Knowledge Center for the labels are right there. I encourage anybody to go look for that. Uh, there are vendors. We do keep a list of vendors for selling labels. We don't sell labels, like I said. You can use anybody you want, but there is a list of people who can make them for you. All right, uh, this is where we're going to take a break. It is uh, five after, a little bit after uh, 10 o'clock. Why don't we break for about 10 minutes? All right, so um, I talked about registration, and now I have to talk about reporting. As I said earlier, those are two different things in my opinion. <clears throat> the uh, registration is the initial, initial registration of the, the vehicle, sorry, and the reporting is your annual requirement. Now part of the problem with reporting or part of the good thing about reporting is that uh, it comes in based on your fleet size. And at the, the times are shown here, the large fleets <clears throat> already have, to be, have been reporting since 2012. Medium fleets started last year and small fleets start next year. What the reporting is, is annually coming in and filling out something called a ROAR. A ROAR is a Responsible Fishing Affirmation Reporting. Now, the ROAR is nothing more than a legal document and a statement that you're making to us saying that what you're telling us is correct. And, and that's why it's there. But what we really want you to do is come in and make sure that everything that's in our system is correct to what your fleet actually is. The ROAR is only there for purposes of making sure that if there's a problem, we actually have a legal avenue to go back and say this person told us this was true and we're finding it not to be true. Okay? The kind of things that you report are changes in your fleet, uh, the, the e roar or the ROAR, and then um, any vehicles that you're designating as a low use or AG, you have to have hour meter readings for. Uh, and I had a question yesterday about the, or somebody was saying, why, why do you need hour meter readings for all your vehicles? Well, that's not what I said. 
Uh, we're not asking you to report your hour meter readings for everything you've got in your fleet, only the ones that you're designating as low use and or the more than 50% ag, because that's the only way that we can actually determine whether or not you're exempt from the regulation or partially exempt from the regulation. <clears throat> there is a uh, online e-roar, which means uh, it used to be just a paper form. Now it's online. You do not have to fill out a form and sign it. You can sign it online with the PIN number. Um, it's on the uh, other tools page, ROAR tools. And when you get there, there's a checklist of what we're looking for. And as long as you cover all the items on the checklist, then the E-ROAR the e is done. You're, you're good. Every year fill this out and, and we're fine. You can create a PIN number or get a PIN number, request this PIN number. Uh, and check this box. It'll ask you for the pin because we want to make sure the person who's actually supposed to be doing the roar is the one that's doing the roar. Okay. <clears throat> as far as keeping records, uh, we require you to keep any changes since the fleet was last reported, any newly purchased vehicles, uh, rebuilt engines that are built to a cleaner standard, any uh, VDEX serial numbers. I don't think I, I went over that terminology. Did I uh, describe the um, acronym VDEC to anybody? I'll do that in just a second. You had a question. Sorry, back to the E form. Um, for the responsible official, we have a, I forgot the terminology, like the designated alternative responsible official. So not the actual yeah, head of the company, like, but the so person that's doing the reporting. Yeah, um, that pin only will get emailed to the responsible official, not the designated alternative. Okay. Yeah. So, so that will be an option. <laughs> well, if you have uh, whatever email you have associated with the account oh, okay. is where the PIN is going to go. So if you associate it to, I mean, you're the one that's doing the reporting. Yeah, but we have, um, I don't know the terminology, but it's the designee, the responsible official, you could also have another. A designee. Yeah, and it's not me. It's someone very high up in our company, but the responsible official is like the president of United Airlines. <laughs> like yeah. it's not an option. Right. So it just kind of makes the e-form just not very applicable for a very large company. We still have to do a whole paper copy. Okay. Well, I, I apologize for that. Because our responsible official is like the head of the GSC department. So you'll you'll never talk to that person hardly ever, or, or you can't get the emails it's that they. Like like <coughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if there's a, a functionality for uh, doing what you're asking, yeah. uh, but I would encourage you to contact the doors. Like you talk okay. to Todd Sterling all the time. Todd will yeah. know the answer to that. Yeah, because it would make it easier. Hmm. Like that. Todd, or, Todd or TN both will know whether or not that's something that can happen. Okay. Um, VDEC. <clears throat> VDEC stands for Verified Diesel Emission Control Strategy. It is a long complicated phrase that means retrofit filter. In order to be legal, uh, uh, legally installed on any vehicle in the state of California, a filtration system either has to be OEM and certified with that engine as one of the control uh, pieces of equipment, or it has to go through a verification program run by my agency where the manufacturer of the device provides data that proves that that particular filter will not only work with the engine they're trying to put it on or sell it for, but it also has a uh, durability testing and it provides the reduction in emissions that are required by the regulation. So the reason I bring this up is because we have a couple of things that are going on right now. We have uh, people that have filters that do work on engines but have not gone through the verification procedure. So they're technically not legal because they're not verified by California. We also have people who are buying filters on a secondary market from vehicles that have been um, crushed, damaged vehicles, recycled vehicles. And those are not legal under any circumstance. You can buy them cheaper, but they're not legal to put on any piece of equipment in the state of California. Not only that, we have another thing happening where uh, we have people who are installing filters that have not gone through any training by the manufacturers to do this. They are not approved installers by the manufacturer of the filtration systems. A filter that's installed by somebody that has not been approved by the manufacturer is illegal in the state of California. If one of our officers uh, find that out in the field, that is 
not the equivalent of having all the labels the same number, but it's not a good thing, okay? If we find one that's been recycled, which we found a number of, that is a really bad thing because those filters will, you risk damaging the engine by putting a filter that wasn't built for that engine on it, okay? If you're gonna <coughs> install VDEX, uh, there are serial numbers and family names associated with these. That's part of what you're reporting in the door system. Uh, if you have one that fails, happens fairly regularly for some people because they're not taking care of them. We'd like that information. If you have a delay for putting one of these things on, there is a way to get a, an extension within the system for a manufacturer's delay as long as you've done it at the appropriate time. And that would be before November 1st of the year prior to the compliance year for you, okay? So if you're taking action by November 1st in 2017 and you don't get the filter installed by 2018, there is a way for you to still be compliant, okay? Uh, if you have a special circumstance where it doesn't fit any of the things that I've been talking about or anything that you can find in the door system or the regulation, you just have some weird set of circumstances, there is a way to get that to fit in the system. It requires something called an executive order. And the executive orders are written up by staff and they're approved and signed by our executive officer. If you have one of those, that has to be part of your reporting system. Uh, they're not gonna be that common, but we have had some. Um, we're requiring for this regulation that any and all these records be kept for your fleet until 2030. And that's beyond the date of the sunset of the rule. By the time we get to 2030, if everybody follows what the, term, the terms of the rule are, we should have a very clean fleet in California but, and, and little problems with understanding who's out of compliance. All right, some questions. <clears throat> what benefit does a large fleet get when it splits into smaller portions? Each fleet can determine their avenue based on where they are and um, the size of their fleet, okay? It does not shrink the portion size. How soon must you report newly purchased vehicles indoors? 30 days. Within 30 days, good. All right, what should you do if you ever buy a vehicle and can't transfer the EIN? <laughs> Call a previous owner and yell at them. No. I know you've already said you've done that, some of you, okay. Uh, create a new one, no, you can't do that. Um, call the doors hotline for help, yes. Yeah, well you can, but it doesn't quite work. All right, the, the, where the rubber meets the road, the actual emission requirements under this regulation, what we're looking for, okay. As I said, we already received uh, approval from EPA to, uh, to enforce this rule in its entirety. So we are now looking to get emission reductions from fleets that are under this rule in the state of California. If you need more information out there, there's an advisory. The first thing you have to deal with is a restriction built into the rule on adding older type uh, tier vehicles or engines. Currently, uh, and there are also performance requirements. So let's get to the tier ban. Um, there is a ban on adding tier zeros. And there was an interesting period of time, basically from 2007 to 2010, where even though the law that was adopted by us said you cannot add tier zeros because we were not given permission by the federal government to implement that portion of the rule, you could still add tier zeros between 2007 and 2010. Once we got the authority, no more adding of tier zeros. Does that mean if you have a tier zero that you have to get rid of it? No. No, if you have one, you can keep it, you can run it. The problem for you is going to be maintaining your fleet average with the tier zero as part of your fleet. Because the tier zero emission rates are so high, so significant, that your average will skyrocket because even just one vehicle will make your average go up significantly. Um, let's get to this. Beginning January um, uh, 1st of 2014, the large and medium fleets could not add tier ones. Okay, the tier zero was for all fleet sizes. Banning tier twos, beginning 2018, large medium fleets, 2023 for small fleets. So ultimately when this rule is over, 
there shouldn't be anything less than tier twos in this in any fleet in California. Okay. I've given you a little bit easier way I think to look at this. It's a graphical color coded form which gives you the year and then the tier and then the fleet size on when you can add. So right now looking at this chart <clears throat> regardless of fleet size what what can you add? Yeah until 2018 anybody can add tier two. Okay. All right. Uh, there is a way that you can add some older tiers if you're purchasing an entire fleet. If you're taking over a company, even though there's a ban on adding them to your own fleet, if you're taking over a company and everything that they have, and they have tier zeros and ones, you could incorporate those into your fleet. If the fleet is in compliance, you don't have a restriction. You can add everything. If the fleet is not compliant, then each vehicle has to meet the standard, uh, each the minimum tier, which should be tier two at this point. Okay. Now the performance requirements. The performance. I'm going to keep saying that until my voice completely goes away. Um, the performance requirements, uh, as we said before. There are two, or as I said before, or maybe I said, there are two options for complying with this rule as far as the performance requirements are concerned. You can either meet a fleet NOx average or you can apply um, best available control technology to a percentage of your fleet over time. And we'll discuss both those. But the implementation is shown here on the screen. For large fleets, when did they have to report? When did they have to start reporting? 2012. They didn't have to start doing anything until 2014. Medium fleets had to start reporting in what year? 2016. They didn't have to start doing anything until 2017. Small fleets, when do they have to report? 2018. It's not on the screen. I'm asked, everybody's looking at the screen like, I can't see it, I can't see it. No, it, 2018. They have to report next year. But there's a year lag before they have to actually start doing anything. That's the way this rule was put in place. So, so reporting one year or two years in advance, and then you, so you know what you're supposed to be doing, hopefully, and you, you go to it the following year. Okay? Uh, for fleet average requirements, it is a NOx-based average, and we're talking about uh, grams per brake horsepower hour. Are you all familiar with that terminology, brake horsepower hour? Does anybody know what that means, that they can explain it? Okay, I'll ask you some questions. If you have an engine that is built that can produce 100 horsepower, is that the amount of work that you get out of the back end? Why? It's not. Why? There, there's friction loss. You could lose anywhere from 10% uh, up to 50% of the horsepower that the engine is capable of producing between the engine and where it actually gets output that what you're outputting from the engine is the brake horsepower hour. So what, because that's what the actual work is, that's what we base the requirement on, right? <clears throat> oh, I already told you that we will still get PM reductions regardless of just the fact that it's a NOx rule, but uh, it's the, the PM's <coughs> not going to be listed anywhere in the rule as far as uh, control. So um, what we do and, and this calculation is done for you. And it's going to sound complicated when I get to the next several slides. Uh, but you don't have to worry about it because the calculation is taken care of as long as you report your vehicles properly in the system. We take a look at every single vehicle's engine that you report. We categorize it by horsepower, so tier. And then we, av we create an average based, a it's a horsepower weighted average. So you get one single number that represents your emission rate for that fleet in grams per brake horsepower hour of NOx. We compare that number to what the standard is. And if you're above the standard, you've got to do something to bring it below. If you're below the standard, you're in compliance. Simple as that. <clears throat> so the, the emission factors is where uh, a lot of people would have a problem with this because they're not that's simple to find. If you work in air pollution, you probably have a way to do it. Most people that do this, that kind of work can, they know what they are and they can get to them, but it's, it's work to get it sometimes. 
so we do it for you. When the federal government certifies an engine, they certify it to an emission rate. That is the emission factor that we use in the system. There is degradation over time for all engines. So even though an engine was certified to a particular standard, over time the emission rate of that engine is going to go up. But we're not, we're not worried about that. We don't base the regulation on that because we're not going to have smog checks for these vehicles. We're basing it on what the certification standard was when that engine was certified by the federal government. And, and that's, that's to your advantage, actually, because you don't want to deal with the smog check program for off-road vehicles. Uh, by the way, it's probably never going to happen. Um, we assign those uh, based on the engine model year, and we have them listed on. There are some that are listed on the emission control labels. Not all ECLs will have the emission factors on them, but if you find it on there, you get an idea of what it is. Uh, for on-road and alternate fuel engines, because some of those are in this rule, uh, remember I told you there are some on-road vehicles that wind up being in this regulation, we would encourage you to, um, to contact the program staff to make sure you get the right number in there for your particular vehicle. Uh, does everybody know what a flex engine is? Okay. <clears throat> Going back to that tier chart that you, you have in your handout, The tier, when there's a tier change for a particular horsepower category, it's at the end of a year. So December 31st, it's legal to manufacture a tier two for that particular horsepower category. January 1st, it's illegal to manufacture anything less than a tier three. That's called a tier change. And it happens for all horsepower ratings. The problem with that is that manufacturers can't change on that quick of a dime. They're manufacturing engines, and they have to retool to manufacture the new tier. So whenever there's a tier change, uh, the system has built into it the ability for the manufacturer to have an additional six months to change over. They can still produce the old tier, and it's counted as the new tier. Those are flexibility engines because of the flexibility that the federal government allows with the, the determining the tiers and certification program. Uh, we have encapsulated that into the DOORS reporting system so that you, if you have a flex engine, you can still report it and still get credit for it being a flex engine. When you report, this is a flex engine. You can see where it says that right there. <coughs> when you report these engines, if you have one like this, report the production year, not the model year. Why am I saying that? because the model year is going to be in the next tier range. Okay, you're going to get the benefit of having that flex engine be, even though it's producing more emissions than the, the current legal tier, you're going to get the benefit because it's in that flex program. Okay. All right, so the average. This is where it looks complicated, but really, um, you don't have to do this math. I only put these up here because I want everybody to understand how the door system does this. So when, the door, when you report a vehicle, you report the, the horsepower rating and you report how many of those you have. So we, our system will count how many of each horsepower rating you have. We're going to add. Uh, each one of those has a, uh, a, a fleet average target that it's supposed to meet for that particular horsepower rating. When we do this, we'll say, let's say you had uh, five of the 25 to 49 horsepower and five of the 75 to 99 horsepower. We're going to take five times the 5.8 and five times the 7.1 and come up with a single number. And then we're going to add the total horsepower for all 10 of those engines and make a, a mathematical calculation to determine one uh, emission factor for all horsepower that you have. That's how the system calculates it, so you don't have to. Um, but those are the numbers we're using right here. And if you want to go into the math, I've provided that for you. But again, the system does this automatically. Uh, small fleets have a different set of emission factors. And again, that, that's why it's advantageous to have a small fleet. Uh, the captive attainment would, might be something very beneficial to you because the emission factors are a little bit higher, which means you get more emissions on a small fleet than you do on a larger or medium fleet. 
uh, but it's still, the system will automatically calculate that for you. Now we get to the, uh, that's not the complicated part, but it's the part that was uh, allowed, but actually what changed between 2007 and 2010. What did I say happened again between 07 and 10? No, not the recession. I'm talking about the, the federal government thing. Yeah, so we, we got approval. But originally, the rule said you had to apply filters, which is considered one part of best available control technology. Because we got rid of that requirement as a requirement, but we allowed it as a possibility in the rule, we still have to provide you an avenue for using that as a means of complying with the regulation. So for best available, best, best available control technology, Filtering vehicles is one of the options. Uh, turning over is another option. Uh, replacing horsepower is, is the option. So you're either getting rid of or repowering a certain percentage of the horsepower to a newer standard each year, or you're applying filtration systems to that percentage of horsepower each year. The percentages, and you have to apply this to the older engines first. So I got a question for you. Um, can you apply a filtration system to a tier zero or tier one engine? Tier zero, no, tier one, maybe. That's the right answer. There is a, a no likelihood, in my opinion at all, of putting a filtration system on a tier zero and, have, and expecting it to work. Okay. Tier one, some. But they still have a high enough emission rate that it's unlikely you're going to be happy with the result. So what does that mean as far as the back percentage turnover option? It means that you're going to be either repowering or getting rid of this equipment. It doesn't mean you're going to be putting filters on it. And uh, if you follow the backed option, we're requiring that you do those zeros and ones first. Okay. And every, the actions that you take if you follow this have to be finished by January 1st of the compliance year that you're trying to meet the standard. So if between 2017 and 2018, you're in a medium or large fleet and you have to reduce a particular percentage of your horsepower or filter a percentage of your horsepower, that reduction or that filter installation has to take place prior to January 1st in order to qualify as meeting the terms of the regulation. Okay. And we've already got to, oh, I was going to go back. You guys recognize that picture? Anybody in the room? What show is that from? <laughs> Yesterday, I had at least uh, half a dozen people who were younger, and they had no idea. <laughs> Absolutely no idea. And uh, Becky from Roseanne. Where did that go? <laughs> <laughs> that was about 20 years after this. I know. <laughs> Maybe even 30 years. This was in the uh, late 60s and 70s that that, that show was uh, playing. Um, I don't even know if it made 1970, but anyway. <clears throat> Did you? Okay. Um, anyway, you can turn over, which means to retire or sell. <laughs> Price is right. Um, you can make permanent low use. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. You can repower with the cleaner engine. Uh, there are two different terminologies used for, for uh, redoing engines. One is rebuilding. The other is repowering. If you rebuild an engine, you're not changing the tier standard. You're just making it new to the same standard it had before. If you're repowering, you're changing the equipment that's on that engine so that it is a new tier standard and meets a lower emission rate. Okay? That is one of the options. Uh, rebuilding to a more stringent standard, I put that in there because some people use that terminology, but generally speaking, that is <coughs> incredibly rare. Retrofitting, that's the filtration system. And we require, if you're going to do that, that you apply the highest level of VDEX available for that engine. Early in this presentation, I went over the fact that there were multiple types of, of filtration systems. Does anybody remember how many levels there were? Three. Three levels. If level one is the only filter that's available for a particular engine that's verified, there is a, a way for that to be the VDEX that you install. That is not going to be that common because uh, for most engines now, there are minimum level three filters available. Okay. 
Oh, and, and you guys, I say guys, you owners have to deal with the visibility issue if you decide to do that because it's still against OSHA regulations to install anything that blocks the operator's views because we're not requiring it. If you decide that you want to install a VDEC, it's your responsibility to deal with that particular issue. Okay. Here are the compliance rates if you decide to follow this. <clears throat> You'll notice that it, um, it starts in the, um, the first compliance year. So I told you before, you report one year, you start complying the next year. Uh, you, this is a percentage of your, the total horsepower of your fleet that has to go through the turnover or repower or VDEX. All right, let me get through this. Here's an example. We have a, a medium fleet uh, for 2017 that has to turn over 8%. If you went back and look at the chart, that was their requirement for this year. The fleet size at the end of 2015 was 4,532 horsepower. So 8% of that is 363 that has to be turned over. Four vehicles meet backed exemptions, so they're not part of the turnover rate. Uh, the fleet is subject to backed for 2017. The horsepower rating that we're looking for that's subject to back is 3676. We have to take 363 horsepower from that 300, that 3,676, and that involves three vehicles. You've got the horsepower ratings there for a total of 480. Now, 480 is more than 363. What happens to the horsepower difference? It's rolled over to the following year. So whatever that horsepower range, the system will keep track of this. So if next year you're required to turn over uh, another 400 horsepower, we're going to deduct the horsepower that you've already turned over. So your actual requirement is going to be less for the next year. Okay. And those have to be tier zero or one? <clears throat> first. Okay. Tier zero or one first. You can turn over other ones if you don't have tier zeros or ones. Mm -hmm. But yeah, those are first. Okay. There are some backed exemptions. You, the example I just used gave you a couple, but let's go over some of the other ones. If you have any vehicle that's less than 10 years old, it's exempt from back requirements. Specialty vehicles, vehicles that have OEM diesel particulate filters, Tier 4 or Tier 4 interim, those are for all fleets. For medium and large fleets, if you've installed the highest level of PMV decks within the last six years. Yes? What's an example of a specialty vehicle? That's a very good example, I, I, or a good question. Um, the best thing I can say is if you have a vehicle that, um, God, I, I had an example that I was talking to somebody the other week, last week about this, where they have, they, they bought a chassis with an engine on it, and they basically built their vehicle around that chassis and it was uh, a guy that did specialty landscaping where he had a crane on it and he had this other component to it and it was the actual chassis was five times more expensive I mean the what he put on it was five times more expensive than the engine and the chassis itself it would be incredibly difficult and incredibly expensive for him to replace that or to put any maybe he couldn't put a filter on it those are circumstances where you would have to talk to program staff or the reporting staff to determine whether or not your particular vehicle qualifies as a specialty vehicle. But they're ones that, that cannot be replaced easily and they're very specialized usually. Okay, um, if you uh, uh, applied the highest level of PM VDEX before 1-1 one, one of 13, you can apply 15% of the total horsepower as of 12-31-12 for an exemption from backed credits or backed updates. For small fleets, uh, if there is no VDEX, highest level VDEX available within 10 months prior to the compliant date, then that particular uh, vehicle or the engine of that vehicle is exempt from the backed calculation. <coughs> and the highest level of VDEX available at the time of installation. Okay. So uh, this is a, a just a, another way of looking at it. I'm not going to go through this because I already did. This is a pictorial way of looking at what I just discussed. 
And I included it in there because some people are, are more able to read this than they are just the text. Okay. If you want to determine what's going to happen with your fleet, <clears throat> but you don't feel like going online to do it, we have a tool available for you to do this. That is called the Fleet Calculator. It is downloadable from the DOORS reporting system or the DOORS web pages and it essentially allows, it has uh, fields in it and does the calculations so that you can move equipment in and out, you can apply VDEX to equipment whenever you want and it tells you where, what that does for your fleet. It's a way for you to plan without actually having to be online within the DOORS system. And, and it also uh, the way this functions is the, you cannot download all the information from your DOORS account automatically. You have to cut and paste. So you have your DOORS fleet, highlight it, copy it, and it should paste directly into the same fields that are in the Excel spreadsheet. Okay. There is a tutorial for using it, um, and it is something that we highly recommend. If, the, the example I used yesterday in class was, you know, not everybody's um, internet connection is perfectly stable. And if you happen to be in the middle of making changes in your DOORS account and the system goes down, it could create problems for you or you could miss data or something like that with a fleet calculator, something you could do completely offline and not have to worry about any connection issues. That's why we put it on there. And it also allows you to make changes uh, where you can delete a vehicle where you might not actually want to do that from your fleet because if you delete it from your actual DOORS account you're going to have to re-add it if you keep it. Yes? Is the, um, the fleet average calculator uh, download available for small fleets? Right it's available for anybody, any fleet, any size fleet. Yeah. All right. Uh, data for fleet average calculator. Yeah, you, you, it gives you a, a place to download it and a place to actually do the cut and paste. All right, this is what it looks like. This is uh, when you, you cut and paste that and you put it into the, into the spreadsheet, okay? That's what the spreadsheet looks like. All right, <clears throat> let's talk about a few other provisions in this regulation that are important for you to understand uh, as far as determining maybe some of the avenues you want to use to comply. We're going to talk about the uh, optional path for Really small fleets, if you have less than 500 horsepower uh, and the vehicles, and that includes everything, the low use, any, any vehicle that you would normally be exempt from using your horsepower calculation to determine fleet size, if you still stay under 500 horsepower, then you're considered to be uh, a smallest fleet. And there's an optional plan which allows you to, fill, to, to phase in uh, tier two or higher engines on a percentage of your horsepower uh, rate starting in 2019. Again, this is optional uh, and it's only for the very smallest fleets that are allowed to do this. Let's talk about low use because I did say that low use is, uh, is exempt from this particular regulation. You don't use the horsepower to calculate anything with low use, with, with your fleet size, if you have low use. There are two types of low use. First of all, the low use uh, number of hours is 200 per year, less than 200 per year. That can either be your previous year's reading or an average of three years. All right? and, and that's actually a little different than most of our rules. If you happen to be in truckers, low use is only a single year. There's no averaging. But the door system allows you to take a three-year running average for the, for the previous three years to determine low use. Yes? Can you do that for LSI, too, for low use? Uh, LSI, is that a three-year average, Tien? I, I don't remember seeing that anywhere in the system. Yeah. This was out of the ordinary when they put it in here, because that was not something that, that uh, the staff, uh, well, the staff wanted to do it, but management did not want to do it. But it was actually put in because we had a lot of industry saying that it was necessary to do that, yeah. okay? All right, so <clears throat> let's say you have one that you want to designate as low use, but it's a vehicle that is still very useful to you, and if business happened to pick up, you might want to use it more than 200 hours. You could, I would put that into something called year-by-year -year low use, because the year-by-year -year low use is only 
it's only based on the previous year or three years average. If it was low use, you can designate it a low use in January or by March 1st when you report. You have to report your hour meter readings. And then the next year, if you decide I want to take this out of low use, well then you can and you can put it back into your fleet. As long as it's in the year by year, the horsepower and the, the emission rates, the tier, none of that is used to calculate whether or not you're in compliance. You can, it's flexible, you can go in and out. If you decide that there's no way that the particular vehicle you're trying to designate as low use is ever gonna go over 200 hours, or average over 200 hours, then you can designate it as permanent low use. <coughs> that actually generates a backed credit when you do that. So uh, it would reduce the percentage of backed that you have to do in any given year. It gives you a credit for that. The problem is that is if you're telling us that it's going to be permanent low use, you pretty much can never bring it back. If it ever winds up going over the 200 hours, that vehicle is not, it's not legal to operate in California. You can't sell it to somebody else in California because it will not be able to be registered by anyone else in California. It's a, for anyone in this state, it essentially becomes a boat anchor. You can sell it out of state, out of country, but for California, that vehicle and engine in it are done. Uh, we have many people that like this option because they have very low use equipment and they like the backed uh, credit that they get for this. Does everybody understand these two options? Okay, good. <clears throat> there are some early credits that are still available. Uh, if you have previous repowers, we give full credit for that. Partial credit for retiring, selling, or replacing vehicles before your actual deadline. Um, double credit for PM exhaust retrofits is still available for small fleets. So if you, when did I say small fleets have to report? 2018. When did I say they have to start doing something? So if you have a small fleet and you want to start applying the BACT or VDEX between now and 2019, if you do it, you get double credits for the rest of your fleet under the BACT calculation. That could be very advantageous. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, good. All right. Um, there are no, there are no uh, penalties if you can't get a... a VDEC installed uh, as long as you take, if you show proof that you were in contract prior to November 1st of the year before you were actually supposed to have the VDEC installed. And by proof I mean contract for purchase or contract for work to install the filter on the particular vehicle that you're trying to get this for. And believe it or not, VDEC manufacturers in many cases are uh, up to six months out as far as being able to put filters, have them available to be installed on some equipment. Okay. You demonstrate the uh, compliance using the average calculator and you have to show proof uh, in, in, if, in order to get this um, credit. So for out-of-state fleets, out-of-state fleets essentially, um, they have to comply with the rule, they have a stricter standard. They have to comply with whatever the standard is for their particular fleet size pretty much immediately after they come in the state. They've got 30 days to report this. There was a question yesterday that came up. If I bring a new fleet, if a new fleet comes into California and you, you're given 30 days to report all new changes or new fleets, aren't they in compliance for 30 days even though I say as soon as they come into the state they have to be in compliance with their particular fleet size standard? And the answer is no, they have to be in compliance with it they just have 30 days to report that they're in compliance with it. All right, so, but it is a higher standard of proof for those fleets coming in from out of state. And that's on purpose. Because what, ultimately what we want to do with, this, with enforcement of this rule, or any of our rules, is to level the playing field. We don't want people living and working here and operating this kind of equipment that are having to comply with our regulations to be at a disadvantage when a fleet comes in from out of state that doesn't meet the standard. So we put a higher burden of requirement on those fleets, yes? What if an out-of-state um, drill comes in and we're just assembling it and it's shipping to another state? Do I still need to 
it's not it's not being sold or used in the state. It's, not, it's, it's actually just it's a complete assembly coming from you know, China. Yeah, I don't I don't think that's a problem with us at all. To be honest. So you don't need a, I don't think you have to report that. I don't think it's. You you might uh, the only time that I can see that being an issue is if um, if you actually were part of an enforcement action that was happening somewhere between where it was go coming from and going to. Right. But the problem, the, the reason I don't think that's ever likely to happen is, for this rule anyway, is off-road enforcement doesn't happen on our roads. It happens on construction sites. Yeah, and it's in our shop, so. So I, I really don't see that being an issue. Okay. Yes? Oh, I have a question, too. And I asked for advice on this with Doors Hotline. I just want to see if your advice matches. Okay. This has already happened. You're trying to, you're trying to trick me. It's going to happen again in the future. <coughs> okay. Whenever there's like a Super Bowl, we'll sometimes import equipment from out of state. Okay. It meets the doors requirements, like okay. tier three, and it's just only being used for a week, and then we send it back. And so I was curious, do I have to go through the registration because it's less than 30 days and it's in compliance? That's a very good question, and there's two, two different answers to that. Technically, you've got 30 days to report. Technically, as soon as it comes in the state, it has to be in compliance. If you report it, it's got to be labeled. You're going to get EINs. Um, <coughs> yes? For Con Expo. So if it's coming in just for Con Expo and then going back to what it this rule, This rule does not have the same flexibility that the trucker's rule has yeah. in that we allow non-compliant equipment to come in for short periods of time without registration. It's like three days. Yeah, uh, it is a three-day pass. That would be, Super Bowl would, might be three days the whole time you're using it. I don't know. What did the reporting staff say? Because I'm going to say that it doesn't need to, but I don't know for That's sure. That's what they told me, too. Yeah. But they wouldn't give it to me in writing, so maybe you're missing. You know why? They won't give it to you in writing because it doesn't say that in the rule. Yeah. They just told me yeah. I just talked to the person's name I talked to. Was, it, was, it, was it Tien? No, it wasn't Tien. I can't remember who it was, but it just made me really nervous. No, I get that, but um, for that's such a transitory uh, situation and the equipment that you're bringing in is if it wouldn't actually put your fleet out of compliance I don't see why it would be a yeah. problem and that's what it made, it made sense right the, the only the only time that I could see that being an issue is if if again it was on site and we uh -huh. did some type of enforcement action and we're seeing all these pieces of equipment that don't have any EINs you would get a citation it would have to be unraveled through the um, office conference process that our enforcement division goes through. Yeah, we figure it's like two pieces of equipment, so yeah. out of like our thousand. You just thousands. drape something over it for a couple of days, yeah. hide it behind the wall over here. Yeah. Parking, parking. Park, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Then, then, then only the guys and girls in our office that actually make it to the Super Bowl or have a chance to see it, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, like anybody in our office actually went to a Super Bowl. Yeah, we didn't even get to. <laughs> No, not when those tickets are costing five to ten thousand dollars a piece. All right. Um, okay, so we already went over that. Question seven: What is the lowest tier vehicle uh, can be and still be added to a fleet this year? Tier two. Right. What type of emissions are being averaged in the fleet average method? Knox brake horsepower hour. How much back credit would a small fleet get if 140 horsepower was retrofitted today? with a level three DPF? And why? Because you know the answer, it's on your sheet. It's 280 because remember a small fleet is still getting double credits. So that's where, that's where it's calculated. So the way that works is they're getting 280 horsepower credit. So if their first requirement is 280, they don't have to do anything. <clears throat> okay. Or I should say they've already done it, so they get a benefit. We got some uh, resources and contact information. Um, all right. Um, we already went over the fact that there's a knowledge base available to you online. I'm giving you the links for that. That's the address. That's what it looks like. There's a tremendous amount of information about the off-road regulation, including a set of advisories about, um, so an advisory is, um, 
It's a document produced by a program that explains or gives more information about an interpretation within the rule. So for example, there's one on limits on idling. We put the idling limit in the rule to begin with, five minutes of non-essential idling, and there were all kinds of questions about what circumstances constitute essential idling. So there is an advisory that was created that gives a lot of detail as far as what, they, what we consider to be essential idling. That's what advisories are for. They come out all the time. You can put yourself in um, listservs, which I think I have, no, I don't have that here. But um, if you want to get, sorry, if you want to get regular advisories on any of our programs, then the best avenue that I can give you is to sign up for a listserv on our webpage. There is a, if you just go to the main page, you can, let me see if I got a picture here. Uh, right up here where it says search ARB, if you type in the word listserv, L-I-S-T-S-E-R-V, hit return, it's going to give you a bunch of links, but the very first one is going to be the link to sign up for ARB's listservs. There are over 20 different listservs that you can sign up and register for on our web pages. I do not recommend signing up for all of them. You'll get an email about every 30 seconds. But there are some very interesting ones. We've got ones for off-road, on-road, uh, TRU, dredge. There's training listservs. Uh, there's, there's just a bunch of different ones. They all have good information, but be prepared to get that information sent to you. That's what you're telling us, is that you're allowing us to send you this information. If you want to sign up for a listserv, I can help you with that. If you want to take your name off a listserv, I cannot help you with that. <clears throat> Once you're in a listserv, the only way you can get out is to, when an email is sent to you, there will be a link somewhere on the bottom of that page that says, remove me from this listserv. That is the only way that you can get out of it. I get emails periodically from people I send listserv notices to saying, that, well, they cuss at me, but they say, take me off of this list, <laughs> and I can't do it. So it's, it's, uh, it's on your end as, as soon as you put your name in there. All right, <clears throat> I'm not gonna read through this. Basically, these are the things we went over today. Do we have anybody that has any additional questions? Yeah, you know, you're talking about um, two engine and one being just like a stationary engine. Yeah. What if you were to have, say, a, port a, a portable engine? Right. Yeah. Say, what if you have one on, say, a scraper that has a transmission attached to it powering in the rear end of. That's a power takeoff device, right? Or is it running? It's, it's actually. It self propels, <coughs> propels the rear of the machine. It's got an actual transmission, differentials, everything. So this is a, a two engine vehicle where both engines are driving the vehicle? Yes. That would be considered specialty, and it would have to be uh, registered and uh, doors that way. Okay. So um, you, you'd have two EINs. Yeah. Two yes. separate EINs. Two separate EINs. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, the last thing that, uh, that I would appreciate very much is the very last page on your handout is an evaluation. If you would fill it out leave it at the table, that'd be awesome. If you didn't sign in on the registration, do it on your way out. And other than that, I appreciate your time, guys. Yeah.